When I started Melba's Restaurant and Catering here in Harlem, I was really thinking about my grandma Amelia. She taught me the best way to take care of people was through food. Now, I take care of the film industry week in and week out. They know what they want, and it's got to be good. Production catering is a big part of our business, and that means more chefs, more servers, more jobs in the neighborhood. My business works in New York because the film business works for New York. Welcome back, everyone. Hope everyone had a nice lunch. I'd like to welcome now the moderator for our first afternoon masterclass session, Donna Gelati. Donna? Well, you guys are the greatest. I love this audience. Um, I am going to introduce to you now uh, our two guests uh, for the master class. First is producer David Heyman. And the second is the, the writer, director, and producer of Marriage Story, uh, Noah Baumbach. Does this work? I get more applause than either of you because I begged for it when I came out. <laughs> I suggest you learn how to do this. It's like not a bad thing. Um, the are, I don't know the extent to which you uh, have or have not seen Marriage Story. I can only tell you that you must run to the Paris Theater to see it, assuming you can get a ticket because it has nearly been sold out. It's there in the IFC, right? That's the other? Uh, it is a magnificent film, in my opinion, and I don't say that lightly. Um, I think that these two gentlemen have done an amazing job um, bringing it to the screen, and we're going to talk about what, where, and how they did that. Um, Noah, the first question I have for you is, you told me I could ask you things that interest me. <laughs> so the first question that I have for you is, when you're writing... Do you think about the commerciality of what you're writing? Because in my opinion, you made a movie that is a love story about divorce, which on the face of it would not feel commercial. So is that something that enters into your mind? No. <laughs> um. You, that's Although, a sufficient oh, answer, yeah. by the way, no. <laughs> Over the course of 10 movies, maybe it should have, occasionally more than it has. Um, I, but I, 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 I trust or hope that what feels like a movie to me and is interesting to me will be interesting to an audience. That, as well as when you put together um, the, the, both the actors and... David in the mix. Um, it's just always interesting to me because I, I, I never know if people go and say, oh, I'd like to write this movie, but I can't do it because nobody will go and see it. It happens to me all the time. I mean, I, I think, oh, Hidden Figures, I'll develop that. No one will go and see it. But then people do because it interests you. Um, but it, the, to me, Marriage Story is a natural progression from The Squid and the Whale, of which I think you know I am a huge fan. Um, what I'm curious to know is, have you changed as a director from that film to this one? I must have. I, I think, I mean, I, 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 uh, I, 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 in a way, it's probably easier for other people to answer than for me. I mean, because I'm living it in real time. I mean, I'm, I, each movie to me, I go in with the same, the same sort of general ambitions and thoughts and, you know, that, that I want to tell this story and, and I'm, you know, and I mean, and, and maybe a kind of even better answer to your first question is, is that I really try to adhere and stay true to the story I'm telling once I figure out what that is, you know, with this movie, I, it was, like you say, it's a love story during divorce. The, the, another thing I kind of discovered in writing it is that it was, 
that anything I wrote that went out off the, the sort of divorce narrative felt extraneous, even if there were scenes that that I really liked or they were good good character stuff, or um, because what was clear to me is that everyday life doesn't stop. Divorce can be all encompassing, but everyday life doesn't understand that, and it doesn't stop, and you have to still do all the same things. You still have to get up in the morning, get your kid to school. You still have to get your hair cut. You know, you still have to think about what you're going to eat that day. Um, you know, other things are going to happen to you out of your control. And so I just stayed, I, I remained aware and open to that while I told the narrative. And I think that uh, that was a kind of key thing for me in, 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 in writing the script. So, so how did how did David come to be involved in this project? Because he's the man of Gigunda pictures. Um, for those of you that have been living under a rock, um, David Heyman has produced all of the Harry Potter films. He is the consistent thread through all of them. They made him, I assume, rich. And... Um, <laughs> And definitely famous. So how, how did that happen? How did you come to... That's why I can produce a Noah Baumbach film. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was kind of what I was getting at, you it's know? It's good to go find rich people to work on a Noah Baumbach film. <laughs> so they... <laughs> how, but how did it happen? Because you... you I mean, look, Gravity... Uh, you're a wonderful producer, and everybody in this room knows it. But Gravity was obvious because Alfonso had done one of the Harry Potters, right? How, you, how did you know one another? How did you come to, and how did you deal with what is, I assume, a lesser budget than what you had on Harry Potter? Well, uh, that's a lot of questions. I know. Um, so I had met Noah a while ago when he was in London working with Wes Anderson on Fantastic Mr. Fox. And we became friends and stayed in touch. And, you know, a couple of years ago, when he was touring with the Meyerowitz stories, we reconnected, and he had written this script, and he asked me to come aboard. And, you know, as a producer, yes, I've made, I had the good fortune to work, you know, to produce the Harry Potter films, and I've made film, you know, films on a large scale, but I've also worked making very small films, you know, films for $60,000, uh, $3 million, um, the range. And one of the gifts that, that, that um, having worked on Harry Potter and worked with Alfonso and now also worked with Quentin Tarantino once upon a time in Hollywood is, and Derek Sianfrance on, you know, uh, film, you know, I'm drawn to filmmakers because as a producer, I think we all know that you're only as good as the filmmaker you work with. No matter, you know, no matter what one does, no matter how hard one pushes, um, <clears throat> it's the director who, Re I mean, a script, obviously. Uh, this is a, a, a script of such beauty, such precision, um, such emotional power, um, such authenticity and truth in every moment um, that it was undeniable. I, I read it, uh, and then obviously, the th I mean, before I read it, it was Noah. And I've admired Noah's work for, you know, for... for, for a long, long time, and so when he asked, there wasn't a moment's hesitation. I mean, going back to your first question about commerciality, um, <clears throat> as a producer, I do think of that, yes. Me too. Me too. Um, but I think of it more in terms of practicality, of how I'm gonna get a film made, what is the budget level, how is that possible? Um, but the governing principle for me is I have to connect with it, I have to find, um, elements that appeal to me, that, that, that I feel like I can bring something to, um, that move me, scare me, make me laugh, make me cry, uh, that I can relate to. And then once, once you find, and, and the filmmaker, again, the filmmaker is everything. But once you find that, then it's about f finding the budget. You know, am, what, am I gonna be able to get the budget that this scale, this film requires? If it's commercial, that to me is, is, is not a consideration, not a primary consideration, unless you're making a film for which that is the primary motor. For me, it's about filmmakers, filmmaking, and stories that I want to tell. 
And, and you know, I wasn't disparaging Harry Potter in any way, shape, or form. It's a magnificent achievement. And it's because you can relate, I think, to Harry Potter as a character, to all those characters that, right, that series went on and on forever I mean, because of that. I mean, we're here to talk about, about marriage story, but I mean, just to give you an example about, you know, Harry Potter, I read an unpublished manuscript that was that I had no ideas. My assistant brought it into me. She, um, I said, what, what was it called? And she said, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. I thought it was a terrible title. Um, I read it, I liked it. I thought if I was lucky, it'd be a small independent British film. I had no idea. So I think that's also, it's really important to, to acknowledge that nobody knows what's commercial. Um, you just know what you like. And I love Noah's script, and I love Noah's films. And so the opportunity to work with him was a privilege. It's, um, well, it's a privilege, I think, because you are, uh, you know, again, I don't say this lightly either, but there are not so many film artists working today. There are people that make, and I'm not in the Marty Scorsese camp of Marvel movies are terrible, but they're, they're, they're just, they're, there's sort of a divide in Hollywood. People that are really artistically committed to what they are doing, you fall into that camp to me. Um, so the reason that I, I asked the question uh, initially is because my instinct is always to, it's always to go and, and find interesting material, but I think that, you know, then you have to figure out where the budget fits in the scheme of things and how that balances out. Just because we are talking to producers. What was the budget of the movie? You don't have to say. It was under $20 it was, million. Dollars. It was, I mean, tier, you know, tier three. Okay. And how many days did you have to shoot it? We had close to, I think we had 50 ultimately. And you did it on two, two coasts, New York and LA. <laughs> okay, when I asked you how you changed as a filmmaker, Squid and the Whale, how many locations did you have? And, and what was the budget and how many shooting days? Do you remember? I think the budget was like a million and a quarter. Right. And um, we had 23 days to shoot it, which was actually less than my first film, which was 24 days to shoot right. it. Yeah. So, so you ask how Noah's changed? <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's what I was asking. Uh, well, I think, but every movie has its own, because then I made, I, I mean, after I made Squid, I made Margot at the Wedding, which was, you know, a... a not a big, big budget, but I mean, it was a, it was more closer to where Marriage Story is, and then, um, and Greenberg similar, and then I went back and made Francis Ha because I wanted to, in a sense, kind of change the paradigm of how a movie could be made, both for myself. I think I saw a kind of creative opportunity in that, um, uh, but also. I just had this concept of like, what if we were shooting a movie right now? Like, why do we have to, why why do we have to do all this stuff in advance? Like, can't, what, I mean, the, the prep is important, obviously, the creative prep. But like, what if we just had a camera right now? Couldn't this be in the movie? I thought, and so that was sort of the a kind of notion behind making Francis. I, but I do find every movie, sort of to what David is saying, has its own. Um, this for creative purposes, and also for pro, from a producerial side it 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 does have its own thing and, and and i don't necessarily take you know the say the comfort or or lack of comfort i had from the last one into the new one i think you find your kind of footing in in you know what the budget will bear um for me with a movie like this though what was so important was to have time which is really the more i do this it's what i look for with all my movies is is time for rehearsal, time, I, do, I tend to do a lot of takes, time for the actors to explore. I don't ever want to leave a day in a, you know, where I feel like, you know, certainly that we didn't get it, but also that, that we didn't explore it fully and didn't feel like we have, that, 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 that we got everything we could, you know, and, and um, uh, so that, that's really what David and I talked about sort of going into it was sort of how do we, uh, you know, create a schedule and an environment where that's possible. I, I think that time is not just the shooting time, it's also the prep time and it's the post time. Because one of the pleasures of working with Noah is, is, is the conversation. 
because he's a great collaborator. Um, you know, he's for a, an auteur filmmaker who's so specific in his in, in his view, and uh, he is an incredible collaborator. Um, the script is the script, but the actor's interpretation he 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 works with and allows in, incredible collaboration. Every member of the you know his. His production side, Cotton Signer, Cameron, everybody. There are endless conversations about process and what is, what the effect he wants to reach and they want to reach together. And you know, you talk about Noah as an artist. One of the things I love about his films, and I think this film is is a masterwork. I'm so proud and privileged to be associated with it. But is that, as a director, his work at times feels invisible. You know, you, it's all about, you, know, you, you can, you're following the story, but you, when you work with him and when you look at the film again and again, every single choice is so considered, whether it be, uh, he was talking the other day with, with, with our mixer about, you know, the, the moment that a sound, the air conditioning comes on in, a, in, a, in an office, the, the blankness of a wall, the wide, use of wide lenses and the positioning of the actors within a space. Um, but the cut point, you know, in some scenes, he knows exactly, well, in every scene, he knows exactly where he's going to cut. So he's like, encouraging actors to move forward with such specificity. Um, every single detail is, is, is managed cons uh, um, by Noah. And it's not something that draws attention to himself. Uh, many directors go, hey, look at me. Not Noah, it's invisible, but Mark, you know, his mark is on every single frame of this every film. Every single frame, I know. I, I agree with you completely. The, um, tell me who it is that has influenced you as a filmmaker. Well, I, I mean, it's, there are, of course, the, the movies that I've grown up with and movies, that, and, and movies I've discovered, people who are... Um, more historical or 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 gone um but like who i mean because to me you people keep talking about um kramer versus kramer regarding your film it's just because it's about divorce i think bob benton is a lovely guy but that's not what i see i mean like i see lubitsch in your movie sure yeah so. well for this movie lubitsch definitely um uh because this movie had what i discovered in it was sort of that it had all these genres embedded in, in the story. I, I kind of, they would reveal themselves in different scenes, and I, in some ways, I felt like my job, both as a writer and director, was to kind of, is when I saw them, was to follow them. So like sometimes scenes could have kind of more thriller aspects to them. Sometimes it was screwball comedy, and 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 we looked at To Be or Not to Be, the Lubitsch movie, um, uh, amazing movie, uh, and. Which is also a theater company and 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 a director and actress. It also had that twentieth century. Also, the Howard Hawks movie, both incredible Carol Lombard performances, is the just amazing. Uh, uh, although John Barrymore and Jack Benny are also pretty good in those movies. The the, um, uh, the but I also looked at Bergman and and. I've been asked about scenes from a marriage because it has sort of thematic things. And of course, I, I love that movie. I love Kramer. I, I, I didn't look specifically at those movies for th this one because in a, in a way, those, they're, they're just inside me now. I, I, but I did look at like Persona uh -huh. uh, because I, I, the framing in Persona, the faces, um, the, the, to what David was saying, the sort of the, the relationship between people in space and, and how he, he, I mean, the, the I think Persona is a, is a perfect movie if there is such a thing. I, I, I find it, every time I see it, it, the first time I saw it in college, I had no idea what to make of it, and I feel like I watch it over and over again, and I, I, I still don't know what it's about, really, except, it, it's, um, except maybe it's about everything. <laughs> um, uh, and, uh, you know, Francois Truffaut is a, I, I love, I love I, the use of music in, in those, uh, in his movies and Jules and Jim and Two English Girls. I love how music kind of announces itself. It sort of almost feels like, and it doesn't play the scene. It plays, it's some other thing. So a, uh, something sad can be playing in a scene that's not necessarily sad. Um, uh, that's work, his work with George Delarue. 
Um, uh, I mean, those were s some of the people. For this, we looked at the red shoes. You know, it's a great. It's also a theater uh, um, movie. One of my favorites. Yeah, wow. I mean, and, and incredible. I mean, Michael Powell. I love all the Powell Pressburger movies. I mean, people who've in influenced me, who I, I like, you know, f friends. You know, people I've come up with. I mean, Wes Anderson, who I I've, I've collaborated with, is a friend, and and I always feel like every time he makes something, I like. Like I'm just in awe. Of, I'm just, and it's like I'm, you know, I, I, I'm, I feel like we've done some things together. But there is this sort of, like, I, I'm just always excited to see what he's doing, and I always learn something. And and um, I've been lucky. I, you know, I, 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 I had a friendship with Mike Nichols, who was. I mean, Can you just tell the Mike Nichols, um, the MGM tele telephone story? Yeah, well, I mean, well, Mike told me this story, um, which I was thinking, I was thinking about, about marriage story. I actually thought about Mike a lot in marriage story, I have to say, because he, because he was, you know, an interpretive director, he, he always knew what the movie was about. In a sense, like he, you know, he would said, you know, the, his quote about the graduate, it's a man who saves himself through madness. And you're like, holy, sh you know, like, like, <laughs> Of course it is, you know, like, I mean, just like, but he knew he could just go right to it. And I think that, that was sort of partly why he would choose certain things, because he knew, he knew I could, he could tell that story. And because I create these things myself, I often, I think in the past, it's, it was a lot of like intuition, feeling, I would kind of know what I was, and I, I, I the more I've done this, and maybe this goes to your previous question, I, I've looked at it that way, is I think about, well, what would Mike say this movie was about? And when, when, when um, at times, actually, I would give Mike the script so he could tell me what my movie was about. <laughs> um, um, uh, but um, he, there's MGM Telephone was a thing he t told me, which was, I, I, it was, it was an actor who had replaced, I think, either maybe Walter Matthau in The Odd Couple on Broadway, who had been an MGM contract player in the old days for the you know, MGM studio. So Mike was curious about what you know, classes they made them take. You know, when you were on contract, you had to take all the sort of different classes, and you, know, you were hired by the studio. So and it was, he said, oh, it was the usual stuff, movement, dance, voice, uh, singing, telephone. And Mike was like, wait, 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 what's telephone? And he said, oh, well, they teach you that when, if you're in a scene and the phone rings and you know you're going to get bad news, you pick up the phone in a very cheerful voice. You say, hello. Yeah, uh, and conversely, if you're in a scene where you're going to get good news on the telephone and the phone rings, you pick it up and you're in a depressed, you're like, hello. Uh, and you always have place to go as an actor. Um, and Mike, in his way of making everything, everything, said, isn't that what every scene really should be? And what we're trying to do as storytellers is MGM telephone all the time. And I, I actually thought about it quite a bit. And if you've seen Marriage Story, there's a scene where, um, where Nicole uh, Scarlett's character is going to serve Charlie Papers, and we there's a whole preamble, a little bit, bitch kind of inspired piece with her family trying to figure it all out and rehearse it, and and then um, and psych the, herself up into doing it in some way, and then as soon as Charlie arrives, he says he announces that he's won a MacArthur grant, and so he has great news. I thought, well, he's going to get bad news in this scene. Let's get start with good news, and that was sort of my. MGM telephone. It was, it was absolutely wonderful, really terrific. Um, I'm sorry that we only have 20 minutes. The, um, MGM telephone took about 15 of <laughs> I, 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 um, But they loved it. They loved the MGM <laughs> telephone. Um, it's wrap it up. We have zero number of minutes left. Thank you very much. Please go and see the movie in the theater. It's fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you, Donna. I'm supposed to introduce. I was going to walk right off. I am going. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome, David. Um, 
I'd like to welcome our next moderator, and that is Elise Perlstein. Um, Elise, where are you? Because please, oh my gosh, how are you, Thea? Um, good. Huh? I'm here. I'm here. Hi. 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 You take over from okay, here. Great. Okay. Bye. <laughs> Hi, I am excited to introduce our next documentary producing masterclass. And please join me in welcoming, we were supposed to have the duo of Julia Reichert and Steve Bognar, um, but Julia wasn't able to be here, so Steve is going to more than carry the weight. Um, they are the co-directors and co-producers of American Factory. So Steve. Hi, Elise. Hi, how are you? I'm good. We've been I'm working good. together for about four years, so yes. we're going to pretend like we've just met. Good to meet you, finally. Nice to meet you. Um, so, as I said, um, Steve and Julia directed American Factory and have directed documentaries for many years, but this is a producing audience, and you also produced the film. So, um, we're going to kind of focus our questions today on producing. And I'm a former producer for many, many years. So. Academy Award nominated for Food Inc. Yeah, yeah. producer. Oh, yeah. Just that. Um, anyway, so I think with documentaries, one of the first questions that always comes up is access. You know, how did you get to tell the story? And I hope a lot of you have seen American Factory, which is an exercise in exquisite access. So, you know, Talk to us about how you got that access. Sure. Can I just show a hand? Says who's seen American Factory? Okay, great. So it's a film about a dead factory coming back to life in Dayton, Ohio, where we, Julia and I, we actually live there. That's key number one, or, or sort of point number one. This factory was empty for years after it had been a GM plant. It was a GM plant for a generation, and for a generation, it, it was an engine f to build the blue-collar middle class of our town, of Dayton, Ohio. You know, at one point, 6,000 people worked there. They were really good jobs. They paid 30 bucks an hour. And so, thousands of people who maybe couldn't have never, you know, they'd never thought of having a job that could, they could own a home or buy a home, they had good lives, you know? And it was, a, it was a multiracial middle class in Dayton, Ohio. That plant closed in 2008. It was like a neutron bomb going off in our town. It was devastating. And we had made a film at that time in 2008 called The Last Truck, about the last truck coming off that plant. We made that with HBO, and we thought we would never go into that factory again. But then seven years later, the news comes to Dayton, Ohio, that a Chinese billionaire has bought this dead factory and is going to bring it back to life. And pretty quickly, people are saying, well, someone should make a film about this. Someone should make a documentary about this. And because we had made the earlier film, our names came up, Julia and mine, and we started talking with the company. What would it mean? And the idea, the company's uh, initial thought was they would hire us to make the film. But we didn't want to do that because then it would not be an independent film and no one would see it. So we said, look, if you trust us, if you take a leap with us, give us real access, but we own it, we have editorial control over it, this is contractualized, and we take zero money from the company, then we will do it. And to their great credit, and, and especially the owner, the, the billionaire entrepreneur, whose name is Chow DeWang, uh, everyone calls him the chairman. The chairman said, yeah, let's do it. And he let, he let us in. Now, I will say, I think the first, so living there is important because we had sort of authenticity as like locals who cared. The earlier film had done well. It was an Oscar nominee, and that made a difference in terms of like having a sense that uh, we knew what we were doing and we could make a good film. So those were two things. And in the early days, the other big factor is, it, you know, every story's got to have conflict and drama and trouble. And that's true in documentary or it's true in fiction. In the early days of this factory, it was like hundreds of Chinese engineers and managers were coming over and thousands of Americans were getting hired and there was so much optimism and excitement. It was so easy to say, yeah, come on in, bring your camera in. You can make a documentary. It only got harder 
gradually. But we were already on the inside, and we were just showing up day after day after day. And so time was a huge factor, and they didn't kick us out. Well, and then, you know, again, since this is a producing crowd, it wasn't just that the chairman, you know, shook your hand and said, make this film. There was some paperwork involved, presumably. There sure was. <laughs> it's, it's, uh... Yeah, so, I mean, I think access, you, you have access, and then you have kind of conditions of access. I think what you're talking about is, you know, what happens to access when things get harder. But, um, you know, once participant got involved in the film, you know, we, we also started talking about how do we make sure that this film gets released, you know, that there's nothing that will stop the release. So there's something that, you know, we worked hard on, which is to make sure, I mean, you can talk about it, but there's, you know, in your access agreement to make sure that um, you don't have, you're not giving the subject any way to stop the film. So. Yeah, the phrase injunctive relief becomes really important. You, you, you know that <laughs> phrase probably, right? Your release forms and your overall agreement have to, include that because otherwise if someone didn't like the outcome of the film they could you know try to stop it and that that is something that we you know we learned along the way and we teamed up with so Julia and I started making this film on our own in 2015 we started filming in 2015 not knowing how long we would film most of the documentaries we make we just start shooting turns out it was 3 years of filming we finished at the end of 2017. We had shot 1,200 hours of footage. It's ridiculous. For a, you know, For a less than two hour long film. And in spring of 2016, we were spending way too much of our own money and we needed to find a partner. And that's when we started, we started editing little clips. Most documentaries, as you, know, you probably know, these days, everybody wants to see a clip. Doesn't care. They don't. No one cares if you have the best written proposal in the world. If you don't have some footage of the world, the characters, the the conflict, you're not going to get funding. And so we started putting together clips, and we took it to you and uh, and Diane Wireman, your your comrade, your colleague, and you all came on board. We we teamed up, and it was a great partnership from that point forward. So at least being a producer. Diane Wireman, also a producer. Not only were you funding our movie at that point, but you all were giving us constant good advice, and we would turn to you when, when weird things happened. And they did. And weird things happened, <laughs> sure, yeah, yeah. So, the, you know, I wanna, do, I wanna mention that, you know, part of the conditions with the company was that they, we were allowed to wander the factory, we had ID badges we could swipe in and out, but they, the company had the right to say to us, not this meeting, not that, you know. And of course, every single person working on that assembly line, we wouldn't film them if they individually didn't give us permission. That's only, that's only the decent thing to do. And so we had to ask a ton of people for permission, and we were constantly asking, can we film that meeting? Can we get in the room for that? And as things got more tense in the factory, so the factory wasn't making a profit like everybody thought it would, and their tension started growing between the Chinese and the Americans. The Chinese expected the Americans to work harder and longer and more selflessly. The Americans expected to be paid more. They were making 12.84 an hour for really hard work in an intensely hot, dangerous factory. And so all this goodwill started to fray. And that's when people like started like, oh, why do we have these cameras in this factory? Why are they filming us? At that us? point, you'd been there for a you yeah, year, and, year, a half, year so and a half. It's like, you're not going anywhere. Right. And there were plenty of times when we were like, oh, they're going to they're gonna have a meeting about this or that. And we said, can we, can we get in? Can we, you know? And they would say no. But we always kept asking. The key, I feel, is like you'll get 20 no's, but then you get one yes, and that's what matters, you know? And we would also, I, I feel like I learned that on a producing level, you've got to make the case for why. So we would say to the executives, look, look, you're grappling with what's going wrong. We need to see you grapple or else, or else it's not part of the story. You know, it's not, I used to, when I was in my younger years as a filmmaker, I would always be so grateful that anyone would let me film anything, right? But it's like, that's, the attitude you got to have is like, look, we're, we're on this journey together. I want to bear witness to the hard stuff you're going through, but you got to trust me and let me bear witness. And that includes when things are shitty. Right. 
Yeah. Um, the other thing, you know, I don't know what kind of producing audience this is, but you know, this is a feature documentary they shot for over three years, 1,200 hours of footage. And you know, I produced a lot of feature documentaries, and I always thought of them as a marathon versus a sprint. You know, maybe a commercial's a sprint or a short film's a sprint. And you know, I, it's really difficult to produce over a long period of time, you know, to manage a budget over a long period of time, especially when you're not sure when your film is over. So can you just speak to some of the challenges and also skills that go along with managing something, you know, producing over time? Well, a budget is always a schedule. A schedule and a budget are interlocked, right? But what do you do when you don't know how long you're going to be filming? Right? We did not know when the end date would be. One of the core dramas in this factory story is that there's a union battle. The workers are, get so frustrated and mad at the, at the Chinese leadership, they, they say, we're going to get the UAW in here. We're going to turn this factory into a unionized factory, and then we'll have some, some ability to push back against all the, 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 the bossing around that's happening. That, was, that became a very hot drama in the film, and yet we didn't know when there would be a union vote. Uh, a union campaign leads, usually leads to a vote, but we had no idea if that vote would happen or when, and would we be filming for like a year more or three years more or, or when. So how do you budget for that, right? You can't, uh, we can't go to participant and say like, well, can you just give us a sliding, like a flexible, <laughs> amount of money to make the film. So we, we, we all brainstormed as best we could, but like we had to think creatively like, okay, well, could this line item, if we have to film like an, another six months more than we thought, could like this line item be reapportioned for that, et cetera. So like Julia and I had, we weren't being paid by the, by the month or the week, we just had a director's fee. And we didn't take that. Uh, we didn't take our director's fee for like a year, or so, maybe a year, maybe longer, because we knew it could be like a, a a kind of a contingency that we could pay our 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 team, our camera people, our sound people, whatever, more by just taking it out of our line item. Now, no, of course, no one wants to do that, but that was the kind of preparation and uh, planning that you had to do in a volatile situation. Well, and I mean, you're talking. We're talking about budgets and fees and line items. Um, you've been, you know, self-funded, you've had grants, you've had, you know, the participant funding, which is equity funding. Um, what kind of considerations do you go through when you're trying to figure out how to fund your projects? We're, so we live in a moment of incredible opportunity for documentary filmmakers, right? It's like nothing, it's, there's never been a time like this when all the streamers want documentaries. They're pouring thousands, mil I mean millions of dollars into documentaries, all the broadcasters. It used to be you had PBS and HBO, right? Now National Geographic is like a huge player in the world of documentary. Netflix, huge player, Hulu, Amazon, and suddenly, you know, Apple and Disney Plus are probably going to get in the game as well. It's like an amazing time to fund, for, for filmmakers, the opportunities abound, but you still have to find the right partner. So when we started talking with Participant, we had known Diane Wireman, uh, who's chief content officer at, at Participant. We'd known her for 20 years. She actually gave me my first grant when I was working on my first film. It was $3,000, and it, was made, it, made, you know, it meant the world to me as a struggling filmmaker. So I'd known her since the late 1990s, and I know she's, you know, she'll be good to work with. And that, that's a, a huge thing. Good people. Uh, Editorial control matters to me and Julia a lot. We retain final cut. And some entities, they say, look, we, we, we have to have final cut because we're the entity, we're the broadcaster, we're the streamer, but you, we'll, we'll honor, we'll trust you, you know, you, you, we're good to work with, you know. But if it's on paper that they have final cut, that makes us uneasy. So we said to participant, like, we have to retain final cut. And well, and just for the record, that is, always going to be a conversation and even a participant it's a conversation it, it often just depends on what the filmmakers relationship is to the subject 
and how many films they've made. And, you know, that's why I think it's really important to find the right partners because especially early in your career, you're, you're not going to get Final Cut most of the time. Um, but if you're working with people you trust, you know, most places don't invoke Final Cut even if they have it because that's like you never want it to get to that. So it's really important to feel that you trust, you know, you, you have a, a, a relationship with, with your whoever's funding your film because you may not actually have editorial, you know, final, final editorial control on every project. That's true, yeah. And you had to have faith in us that we wouldn't go rogue and be crazy people with the editing, right? Even as you gave us final cut. So I think uh, we, that, but that did matter to us and that is a negotiable point. I feel like um, in our relationship with you all, there's also a question of how long do we edit and do we, every summer, right? documentary filmmakers, fiction filmmakers, there's always this question of, should we go for Sundance or not? Because Sundance is like this amazing opportunity. If you're lucky to get in, it's an amazing opportunity to sell your film and every, the world is there. And I remember all of us, we were editing all this insane amount of footage with our brilliant editor, Lindsay Utes, but we, we had a feeling of like, there's no way we can be ready by October to submit to Sundance. And you and Diane were like, I think you can do it. I think you can get it done. And we're like, really? Are you, are you really serious? And it was a dialectic. It was a really healthy, somewhat scary conversation. But every couple weeks, as you would look at cuts, even though for us it was like a sprawling mess, you, could, you, would, you would say to us, well, yeah, but look, that's really starting to hum. And that, you work, work more on that. And Anyway, we did submit to Sundance, and you were right, and we were very lucky. It was, you know, the cut was good enough, and we wor continued working furiously thereafter, but you were right, and we did get in, and that was a huge, huge thing, because then we could sell the film, and we were very fortunate that Netflix picked it up along with higher ground productions. They're, they're teaming up to release the film. Right. If you're, if you're a, you know, independently funded documentary, so you're not being funded by the distributor then you know you're still really dependent on film festivals to kind of launch your film so you know we we're always i think filmmakers and you know we're always looking strategically at the schedule you know schedules do relate to budgets but they also relate to opportunities to launch the film so if you're in a window you know we will kind of push um because we want films to have their best chance and you pushed us, but in a kind way. I, I feel well, because like we felt like it, like it could get there. I mean, we also, you know, it's like no wine before it's time. You know, you can't, you can't force a film. And so, you know, in my experience, it's also clear when a film can't get there. Yeah. And you don't want to, you know, it's better to, to, to let it be its best self and wait until the next opportunity than to shove something out when it's not ready, I think. In 1994, I submitted my first featured film to Sundance, and I, I kind of in my heart knew it wasn't ready. And like two weeks later, I pulled it. I, I, I said it's not, I didn't want to get rejected, right? Because if you get rejected, you, you, you can't resubmit, or like 99% of the time, you can't resubmit. So I pulled it. And uh, it was about the smartest thing I've ever done because I worked on it for another year and it was a way better movie a year later. I submitted it in the fall of 95 and it, got, it premiered at Sundance in 96, you know? Yeah, so you have to be strategic about it's helpful it. helpful to show it to people. Oh, yeah. <laughs> if you don't know, you know, gather a group of people you respect, you know, other filmmakers, your mom, you know, people who know nothing about it so that you can really get a good reality check um, yeah. about whether it's ready or not. I feel like every, film, every documentary filmmaker always believes their film is further ready, is more ready than it actually is, and the test screenings are these horrible wake-up calls that, you, that are necessary. It's like going to the dentist, you know. So there's a delusional process you have to do to keep working so hard because we're getting close. Yeah. Because it's that marathon again. You're yeah. like, I'm tired. Yeah. Let it, let and it. we did a lot of test screening. So a part of our process is uh, every like month or three weeks, we do a test screening. And we gather people who are not filmmakers to look at the cut and give us notes. It just clarifies what's working, what's landing. The, are the jokes landing where there's humor? Uh, you know, is it too muddled? Is it too meandering? All the, all the, all the storytelling issues get figured out. Because not only because people tell you, but because you're in the room while you've, you've seen this, 
you know, while you're while an audience is watching it, you can feel where it's working. And you're watching them, watching. Yeah, and you're feeling them. Um, we don't have that much more time. I'm just wondering, you know, I'm sure every film has its lessons for you, but again, from the producing perspective, what, what, you know, what do you think you learned from this film? What? So we shot an insane amount of footage, and on a producing level, every, every day of filming also becomes like three days, five days, a week, ten weeks of editing. And I wish we could have been more decisive about who, so we followed a lot of people. We followed the blue collar Americans, the blue collar Chinese, the top management that were American, the top management that were Chinese. It was, it was like Downton Abbey, you know, the, the, the upstairs, downstairs, but it was also like Asia, North America, right? And it was really fascinating, but we followed too many people, <laughs> and, honestly. And we, I wish we could have been more decisive about who you know, okay, so this person is going through this kind of drama, but so is that person. We don't need to follow them both. Even though I love both of them, you know, and, or Julia loves both of them or whatever. So I think that would have been smart because we would have saved headache and, and pain in the edit room. Right, yeah, so yeah. if you shoot it, it ripples through the whole pipeline yeah. and of costs and personnel and time and everything. It becomes exponential. Right, yeah. right. One, one little thing has ripple, yeah, big right. ripples. So that's, that's a big lesson. Uh, you know, otherwise, I mean, we, I, I don't have that many uh, reg regrets from how we made, how we made the film. Uh, I think in certain cases, it would have been good to get release forms signed earlier because there were certain situations. So we don't believe, okay, so you meet someone, right? And you're like, can I hang out with you? Can I film with you? I think what you're going through is really fascinating. You don't want to like pull out a big release form right then, right? It's an it's, awkward what, moment in the dating process. Yeah. Like a prenup. A prenup. When does, you know, it's really a buzzkill, <laughs> yeah. right? So we tend to delay. We want to build kind of rapport. We try to build relationship. But we often waited too long, and then it's awkward in a different way. Right. Because, because you, let's say you filmed something where someone gets really pissed off, and they curse, and they're like, not their better angel that they would like to have on camera, right? Then- Would you mind signing that? Yeah, at, at, <laughs> after they've just like, you know, yeah. sp sputtered and, you know, whatever, that's the wrong moment. So right. it's, a, it's always a delicate balance, yeah. but, but in a lot of cases, I wish we would have gotten those releases signed a little earlier. Yeah. You know. well, that's very good practical advice. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, we're out of time, but um, nice chatting with yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you, Elise. Thank you. So thank you, Stephen and Elise. Uh, we're now going to take our final break of the afternoon. For those producers in the room interested in learning more about the Guild, I'd like to invite you up to Tinker uh, to meet with PGA East Chair Kay Rothman and Quasi Foley, our membership manager. They're going to be up there if you, want to have any, if you have any questions about membership. And a reminder, we'll need everybody back in their seats for our final sessions beginning at 3. Thanks.
Welcome back. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you're having a great day. Before we get started with our next session, I'd like to introduce a short video from an annual sponsor of the Guild, Greenslate. Our thanks to Greenslate for all their support. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our next moderator, Tanya Lewis Lee. Tanya. Hi, uh, I'm delighted to introduce Harriet with producer Deborah Martin Chase, writer and director Casey Lemons, and star Cynthia Erivo. So first, I just wanted yeah. to see a show of hands of people who've actually seen the film. Fantastic, yeah. I, I just, I have to say, I've seen it twice. I love the film. I loved it even more the second time. Um, so first, I want to start with Deborah. I wanted to talk about this process. I read that uh, you guys scouted Cynthia when she was doing The Color Purple, which seems like it was a while ago now. Um, what was the journey like to get this film made? Yeah, long. And when did it start, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. No, about five and a half years ago, Greg Howard, who's an old friend, came to me and said he had this script languishing at Disney about Harriet Tubman. And, you know, we should join forces and try and make it happen. And that and was the script he had written already. That was what? A script he had written. He had already. written at, for Disney years before that. It had just been sitting there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, my first reaction was, oh, it's going to be like this little boring slave movie. And... And I read it, and I was like, oh my god, she is a historical action heroine. And that was the motivation that kind of, you know, led us in the process. About a year and a half in, Daniela taplin Lumberg came on board. It's been our great producing partner. And, uh, and then I just I have about two years, and we went through a couple of writers and didn't have the script right, and about two years, before we started shooting, I went to go see The Color Purple and was blown away by this one, this magnificent yes, yes. woman. And As we all were. And said, she's Harriet. You know, physically, spiritually, we met about a week later and she walked in and I was like, this is the woman. But we didn't have a movie yet and she would text me every couple of months, do I have a script yet, do I have a script yet? And, and we did not, but she believed that Danielle and I would get there. And it wasn't until we brought on our friend, the brilliant Casey Lemons, yes. that we had a script and a movie. Fantastic. So Cynthia came first, then we got to Casey. So Casey, when you saw the script that Deborah had, uh, you came on to do your pass and to get your vision right. Yeah, they, um, I, I, I got, um, I took what I thought was a, was a general meeting with Daniela, and partway through the meeting, I could tell she had something on her mind, because she had a little furrow in her brow. <laughs> um, but we were just like, you know, talking about whatever, and then she said, you know, Deborah Martin Chase and I have this Harriet Tubman movie. And I said, oh, I did hear something about that. And she, she said, um, you know, she started talking a little bit more, and I, I was absolutely convinced that she wanted me to rewrite the script. And so I was like, okay, you know, I can fix your script for you, but, um, you know, it'd be much more interesting if I were directing. 
And she said, that's what we're talking about. That, that's, <laughs> that's why you're here. That's why you're here. So, and watching the film, you know, I, I looked at Harriet, I mentioned this to you earlier. I see her as John Wayne would have loved to have played her, right? right? <laughs> um, uh, she's, such a, she's such a heroine to me. Um, is, is that how you saw her, as this sort of action American heroine? Absolutely, I think it's inherent to her story, and that was what was in Gregory's um, script. But what, what I felt was missing was the, um, the, the her of her mm -hmm. and the specific Harrietness and the woman. Right. You know, so I really tried to bring the woman and also what, what was specific about Harriet's actual story. Mm -hmm. So I did months and months of research and read everything mm -hmm. and then tried to put as much of Harriet in it, her, her family, what I thought were her real motivations and, and her passion and her love, you know. Yeah, I, I, I love that, the womanness of her, right? The, the, the love in her life, the, the actually baking was beautiful. Um, talk about putting your team together to make this film. I mean, you have an amazing team. The film looks beautiful. The wardrobe is to die. I want a red velvet coat. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. So, yeah, please tell us about your team. Um, well, I gotta say, when you have the Harriet Tubman movie, the first movie on Harriet Tubman, um, stuff gets easier, you know? Um, but, but I approached my um, production designer, I think, first, Warren Allen Young. We did Talk To Me together. And I thought Talk To Me was so beautiful, you know? So I approached him and he wanted to come on. And then I think Terrence next, because this is my fourth movie with Terrence. And, the music um, is stunning. We have a long collaboration. And then um, Paul Taswell, Ruth recommended Paul, ah. and um, and then Paul came on. That was these are key key pieces mm -hmm. of the creative team, mm -hmm. and so um, you know from there it got really easy. John told like, you know that was a little trick. You know right. we we happen to be advisors at Sundance together. Great, fantastic, and the only and the last question before I get to Cynthia, um, you shot this film in Virginia, which yeah. I thought was interesting. Yeah. Um, you know when I was first watching it, I was thinking it was probably Atlanta, mm -hmm. given money and all of that. Mm -hmm. uh, why, why Virginia in particular? Yeah, we scouted New York and we scouted Virginia. Uh, we scouted New York and Georgia. Mm -hmm. um, and Virginia made a huge play for us. Oh, they did? Uh, yeah, courtship. Like, yeah, we, yeah, we got ah. off the plane. They were, you know, waiting for us. Uh, Andy was waiting and took us out to dinner and wine and dine. And they gave us great tax incentives. Yeah. Not only gave us great tax incentives, the office governor, op, free office space, the governor, the governor gave, us, gave money. us money out of his discretionary fund. They really made they, they it went attractive. It. Well, and that's because it was about Harriet Tubman. Mm -hmm. That they, they cared about the story. Mm -hmm. Are they doing that for films and they're not doing that for films in general? Well, films that are right for them. I mean, this right. is what, this was, you know, her story took, her plantation was in Maryland. So the topography was similar. Mm -hmm. You know, they obviously know how to do period very well. Mm -hmm. So, and they have like one or two crews, mm -hmm. right? And, and the one great one was available. Right. So uh -huh. it just that was key it for me. Sense on, on many, we on got many, the A crew, right? Right, yeah. we got the A. Yeah. Well, yeah. that that helps. <laughs> yeah. Um, Cynthia Revo. Hi. Hi. <laughs> what an amazing performance Thank you. Uh, for Harriet. Um, I have to say, watching you, uh, there's a lot of physicality. Uh, there's a lot of emotion. There's a lot of mentality. There's a lot of spirituality. Um, how did you really prepare to play Harriet Tubman? I, I definitely took some time. When it came to physicality, I'm a fitness freak, um, so it meant that I just threw myself deeper into to training, working myself out, because I didn't. the one thing I didn't want to do was get on set and start playing catch-up. I had a wonderful uh, mentor when I was younger, and he used to say, I used to dance by any chat, and by, by the way, and when, I would, when we would get into our choreography, he would say, don't let the dance make you fit, be fit for the dance. Mm -hmm. And I just applied that to everything. So that's the thing I wanted to do, but just be ready and physically able to do the things she was uh, able to do. Which is an amazing thing, right? Because yeah. obviously Harriet Tubman right. was a physical person. Yes, I mean, very she, much so. you know, and we don't think of women yeah. that way. Even when we see the old image of her, right. you don't necessarily think about her physicality. Right. But, but she has to the be. One, it's one of the things that was noted about her, the fact that she was un imaginably strong for the size that she was. She was five foot, I was five, I'm five foot one. Um, so wow. they, that's what, I guess, 
and in the end, what is what she used to save up the money for the lawyer? Uh, she was hired out to different um, plantations because of how strong she was. Uh, right, yeah. like chopping wood. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to do that. And then um, learning about her spirituality, I wanted to be a, a emotionally and spiritually available to be able to do that with, um, with authenticity. So I started looking at my faith, um, trying to be a bit braver about talking about it, trying to be a bit braver about... Um, using it, being um, present in it. Mm -hmm. um, so I prayed more, mm -hmm. um, I went to church more, I spoke to my mother more, just do, doing those things that would connect me with that mm -hmm. um, so that when I got on set, it wasn't just putting on someone or acting. Right. It was about really accessing what I understood and knew. Um, mentally, I took some space out, did my reading, made sure that I, I understood her, knew who she was, looking at her face, mapping a picture of her. Mm -hmm. And Casey gave me the space to sit with her, talk with her about who it was we were trying to portray, who it was we were trying to show the world. We already knew that she was uh, a physical superhero. We just wanted people to see her as a person, mm -hmm. you know, ground her. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we did the research for that and did the conversations for that. and. I put myself through a bunch of things for it. Yeah. So wonderful. I mean, I love that she's a woman, as, mm -hmm. as Casey mentioned, mm -hmm. with love mm -hmm. in her life, right? I mean, um, you know, seeing her heartbreak yeah. uh, at her husband remarrying. Yeah. I don't want to give it away to you all who haven't seen it. But seeing her go through that heartbreak, the yeah. thought I had was, you know, who would she have been if he had Beautiful. actually... Yeah. been there for her yeah. we would have yeah. we would have missed her yeah. yeah you know um so thank you for your uh tremendous um performance thank Cynthia. You. um so i have a question from the audience mm -hmm. that i'm going to go to um this is from lindsay uh tackling films inspired by true events always adds an extra challenge mm -hmm. how was your team successful and what hardships did you face what parts of the process would you keep and would you do anything differently yeah, um, I don't think I would do anything different. Let me think about that one a second. Um, I really had done the research. So I came to it uh, with the research. And then the, the key crew that I hired are all historians. Okay, so Paul Taswell's a historian. And um, the, you know, great, the great artistic keys are. Um, Terrence is a historian and, and Warren Allen Young, production designer. So they are, they are people who really relish the research and sure. digging into it. So they brought all that. And how long? I mean, you mentioned that you've done a lot. How long was that process of About research? seven months. Seven months, yeah. So seven, in seven months, I probably read, um, I, don't, I don't even know how many. I, I spent seven months purely outlining and researching. Mm -hmm. So I, I read every book about Tubman, every book about the Underground Railroad, um, slave narratives from the period, um, and just books about the period in general. So, so we were very prepared to get that right. right. And I think actually one of our greatest challenges, aside from the money, which is always a challenge, um, was the weather. I mean, it was by all accounts. The what time of year did you shoot it? Last fall. Last fall. Mm -hmm. And everybody came. It was really winter. It was winter. Yeah, it was, you all were cold. cold. It was cold. And <laughs> wet. Extremely it cold. rained like every other day. And it was really, we were living in the mud, in the cold, in the wet, in the rain, in the woods with the bugs. I mean, it really was challenging. <laughs> but it actually, I think, brought everybody closer Thank together you. and closer and together closer with Harriet. Harriet. You know, because mm -hmm. we were we were able to just begin to think about experiencing a sliver of sure. what right. what they what might she what went that, through. Sure, I can think of one thing I would have done differently. We had an agricultural consultant um, that came in um, after I shot a key scene that I could have used earlier. So that was so we had five historical consultants, mm -hmm. a Tubman consultant, Kate Clifford Lawson, um, and uh, two um, professors of African American history and a Civil War consultant, and an agricultural consultant. And the agricultural consultant, I think I would have brought that person in from the in prep, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Anything for you, no? I mean, the, the cold and the rain and all, yes, they, that was definitely challenging. Um, and, and, but I think it was really informative for me. Sure. Um, I, I wanted to do my own stunts, so, I did everything but one of those. You, you did everything but one stunt? Mm -hmm. Yes. Wow. 
Mm -hmm. um, because, because wait, wait, okay, so let's just go back <laughs> for a second. Because your first film yeah. came out a year ago. Yes. Right, okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, because I, I wanted to, um, I wanted to take away anything that would, uh, would remove me from her. Any, any veil that felt like it was in the way of finding out what her story would have been, feeling some of the things she would have felt, was just not useful. So doing the stunts allowed me to, to at least feel what it would have been like to be in her body, yeah. um, I guess. Uh, but when you're in 37 degrees of water, it's very difficult wow. to figure out. Terrifying to a director. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> and the producer. Yeah. Everybody. Yeah. Exactly, <laughs> everybody. Um, you know, Cynthia, what's so great is that they were able to use your amazing voice mm -hmm. in the film, mm -hmm. um, your, your singing voice, and then I know you did the song um, Stand Up. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about uh, the song? and Because yeah. you co-wrote the song as well? Yeah. Yeah, uh, so I, I badgered everyone because I, I felt like it was um, a good idea for me to be a part of that process because I had experienced it and I had learned her and, and I knew her, so I felt like I had something to offer in that department. Um, uh, they had found uh, an amazing writer, Joshua, who had come forward with an idea and then I had the idea, I loved it, but felt like there was something missing. Uh, and I'm, I'm a stickler because he... Him being a man, I felt like it was important to have a woman's voice on it uh, and a woman's viewpoint. So we went away, we sat for about three, four hours, rewrote the, the song, and then I, I stole away one of my friends who's an amazing producer who put the song together. The two of us worked on the sound that you hear on that song. Um, it was really about trying to, trying to give her a, a, a letter of thanks, I guess. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and whilst retelling what you had just seen, giving you another way of hearing the story. Yeah. And I certainly came away from the film with that song in my mind mm -hmm. saying, I can do more. Yeah. I need to stand up and yeah. do more. Um, was it originally scripted for her to sing, or was that because Cynthia? No, no, she's, it's Harriet, the Harriet song. Tubman story. That, that is her story. Yes, yeah, so a very important um, communication, obviously, between the enslaved people, the way that spirituals were used, um, it, that were coded. But it's also very specific to Harriet's story the way she called the enslaved people and let them know she was back and now is the time to come. Or depending on changes of lyrics in verses, she might say, not yet, come later. But so it was very, very specific coded um, language and um, these were the songs that she actually sang. She actually oh. sang Go Down Moses, that was her. She did. Yep. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. It's so it's so wonderful because you know um, it sounds like there's so much that was really close to her story. Mm -hmm. And as I was watching, I wasn't sure what was real and and what was actually historical. So it's wonderful to hear that most of it sounds like historical. Um, so I have another question from the audience. This is for Deborah. Um, Producers are sometimes left in the shadows in the movie making experience. Who was the first person to put money on the table and did agents assist or hinder the process to the film? I love that question. <laughs> Thank you, whoever sent that in. Well, you know, this was a long, is your question? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's a long process, so people came in and out. Um, there was a company that was the first one to put money on the table. Uh, Macro, Charles King, who I adore and who's fantastic. Um, Daniela Tlaplin Lungberg came on board secondly. And we ended up, and I adore Charles, but we ended up wanting to make a different movie. And so he decided to step aside, and Daniela was prepared to finance the movie herself. She has her own film fund. Um, it would have been a smaller version of the movie, but she was prepared to do that. But we needed to get it right. That was the key. What we, you know, one of those is one of those rare situations where we had the money, but the responsibility of getting this story right was huge. And so we just kept pushing until we, you know, again, until we brought Casey on, and really it all came together. We all saw the, you know, the same. Wanted to make the same movie, you know, very much tell the story of a woman, not a woman trying to be a man, but a woman who was multifaceted and fierce and vulnerable and strong and 
craving love and all those great things. So, and, but you know what, agents were very helpful throughout the process. You know, your agent, Frank mm -hmm. Welliger, was immensely helpful and just as, as much as anything, just being that cheerleader on those moments yeah. when things would go bad, Frank would be, no, 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 it's okay, mm -hmm. you know, get up, you know. And, um, but I mean, it really was, you know, the, the, the four of us, mm -hmm. because like I said, Cynthia was in our ear. Mm -hmm. Script ready yet? Script ready yet? <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, that, you know, yeah. held kudos, each other up. Kudos for you for hanging in there and waiting till it was right, because sometimes it's easy to take the money if the money is on the table, and that doesn't always yeah, work. No, Lessons no. learned. Um, uh, and fine, okay, so we've got a couple minutes. Casey, this question is from you from the audience. Where did the fictional bounty hunter villain come from, and why did you choose to make that character African American? Mm -hmm. That was, um, he was, a, that, they had, a, they, Greg had a very similar character in his script. And I liked the idea, and I researched it, and once I found out that yes, there were, I think when you have people that are as so incredibly heroic, you know, as, the, as um, Harriet and the, and the William Stone, the Underground Railroad, I thought to show, I mean, and it was really my goal, just to show this huge texture of African-American life. So um, as we know, there were African-American everything, right? And, and so, but really in this community where you had uh, free people living next to enslaved people and intermarrying them, there were a lot of mercenaries. So especially in Harriet's story, there are a lot of mercenaries. There are people that work for one side and then work for the other side, depending kind of on who's paying them. And it made, it made the world very treacherous because uh, people would turn on them. And so, um, so that happened quite a bit. So he's kind of, in my mind, he's the personification of the, the corrupting system of slavery and what it did to some people. And some were, were redeemable. Walter. And some was Walter, and some were irredeemable. You know, but it's really, it, to me, it was um, more fun to have all of these African-American characters yes. from the incredibly heroic to the vile. Mm -hmm. And that just made it not as black and white. You know, I, I mean, because there, there's been talk about it, obviously. Uh, I'm aware of this. And, um, and I keep thinking to myself, yeah, I guess, I guess I, maybe I, did I have too much fun? Was that, you know? And... Um, and I think about that character being white, and I'm like, oh, no way. Yeah, it right it's on. so much more interesting. And, and to me, uh, it was really something that I was wanting to speak on. I was really trying to speak on the complexity of that, not just black and white. It's like, what can I offer as a filmmaker you know, that's not just black people in a field picking cotton? I wanted all the texture, all the specific details. And, and really to present this, this complex, people were very corrupted by it. And it wasn't just, um, obviously, it was mostly a black and white issue, but, but it did, it had a huge effect on the people that had to deal with that economy, you know, that whole economy. And so I, I did, I wanted to, I wanted to um, preserve that character and well, you did it yeah. brilliantly, and I thank you for that, because that, that's exactly it, the diversity of who we are mm -hmm. as a people, as African-American people, but also seeing how the white people who owned the slaves mm -hmm. had to deal and, and what that was like for them. Casey, really a wonderful, wonderful film. Deborah, Casey, Cynthia, mm -hmm. thank you so much, and congratulations on a beautiful thank film. Thank you very much. Thank you. And so now I'd like to introduce the moderator of our final masterclass session, Lisa Cortez. Please join me in welcoming Dark Waters to the stage. Producer and actor, Mark Ruffalo. Producer, Pam Koffler. And producer, Christine Vachon. Thank you. All right. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be in conversation with everyone here today um, because 
This film was finished on October 21st. Uh, and we were just so blown away by this film directed by Todd Haynes. Um, and this kind of new take on an old genre of the whistleblower film. Um, in the tradition of all the president's men and Silkwood and, you know, just all these stories of power that's gone awry. Um, in this particular story, we're looking at uh, Rob Blot and his uh, tenacious unpacking and addressing what happened in the suit with DuPont. So, um, it's going to open on November 22nd in selected cities and then expand November 28th. Um, the film Dark Waters is based on a 2016 New York Times article called The Lawyer Who Became DuPont's Worst Nightmare. Um, Mark, can you tell us about kind of your history of activism and how it intersected in finding this story and making this story? Sure. Um, so I, uh, I got into activism during the uh, second uh, Iraq war um, and I got uh, pretty, pretty involved in it, um, in, the, in the peace movement. And um, shortly after that, I uh, wanted my family to take a break. So we moved to upstate New York uh, and landed right in the middle of the front lines of the fracking um, gas lands. And um, then it became more personal. I was part of a, a frontline community that was f fighting fossil fuel extraction. <laughs> uh, and um, really like dug in on that issue and started to feel like how important water was in, in sort of uh, bringing us together. Uh, the one thing that I knew about my neighbors is they wanted clean water just as badly as I did, whether they had leased their land to fracking or not. And the only thing that was really standing in the way of them not leasing their land was the misinformation that fracking didn't harm their water. And so it became imperative that I got that kind of information out. Anyway, this movie's about water. It was a, it was a way that I saw I can use filmmaking to um, to support and to intersection with my um, act, uh, activism in a time where we're so divided. Uh, I really wanted a way to broach those divides and I feel like storytelling is the best way to do that. And so after the 2016 election, I really was making it a, um, a conscious decision to try and find projects that did that. So you read the uh, New York Times Magazine article. What was the next journey as a producer to bring it to Todd and to Killer? So um, I read it I, and I started, <laughs> I was in a bidding war against participant. <laughs> and they, uh, Robert Kessel called me up and he said, hey, you know, we just had this great experience working on Spotlight would you like to join forces on this? And I said, yes, that, that sounds good. Um, I don't want to be bidding against you. Uh, and um, you know what that's like. And, um, and, and we, we got it. And uh, you know, I, I reached out to Rob a lot before you know, we closed it. Tell him who Rob is. Rob Balot is the uh, man that the story was about. Um, he's a, he was a lawyer who was uh, working for Taft Law Firm, which is the biggest, one of the biggest uh, corporate defense uh, attorney um, groups in, in the world. And um, he, uh, it's his life story. And he, cr he, he breaks this case. And I wanted to know, I felt like there was something missing from the original story at Taft, some conflict that was happening that really wasn't in the uh, article. I felt like it was really soft-soaked in the article, but I felt like it was essential to really have that conflict to tell the story in the way it needed to be told. So I called Rob and I said, hey man, are you financially sound that you can go to war with Taft if you have to? And, he, and his wife chimed up, we'll tell you everything if you, if you, get, the, if you get the rights. 
<laughs> and uh, yeah, <laughs> and he did. Um, but the question was, is who who to direct it? Uh, first, we we worked on a script, and and it was a very straightforward whistleblower script. It, you, you know, it's very it was a very genre script. You guys you guys saw it, and. Um, I really wanted to do something different with it, and I, I really wanted it to get into character more. It was very story driven, and so, you know, I was racking my brain like, who's kind of a little bit off center for this kind of thing, that can bring something new to the genre? And of course, I, I thought of Todd, and uh, because his characters have something similar, there's this like alienation within this kind of oppressive system and this kind of unspoken depth that each one of them have uh, that maybe is not quite on the surface but so deeply lived in. And um, Yeah, I was really touched by the nuances in not only Rob's character but also his wife who I, I think is, is really, sh uh, it's shown her as a, a attorney herself, but who's become a homemaker, the role that she plays through this very lengthy process. Pam and Christine, um, I believe you mentioned like you, the script arrived, but it took a moment before actually everybody came on board. Can you talk about the collaborative nature uh, that ensued with conceiving and manifesting this uh, film? Uh, well, I'll start and uh you know, um, when it first came to us, I think Todd was, we were super excited at the idea of working with Mark, but also he, he does have, you know, he loves genre of all kinds, and he was a big fan of exactly the movies Mark mentioned, the, you know, the whistleblower genre, which does have its own little genre to itself. And uh, I think when he first read the script, that what he wanted to do is exactly what Mark spoke about, is figure out ways to deepen it and really understand why, since for most whistleblowers, once they actually cross that line, their lives get worse, not better. Um, and at some point, living with what you know has to get worse than upending your life. And that's a specific kind of complicated person that, that manifests that. And I think that that's what Todd really wanted to bring to the script as well. And, and I would say just one of the things Todd would say in all the meetings with department heads and in the creative process is one core idea is what happens to the person who goes up against power. And, and you know, if you were to boil down an idea, I think that's really in the film because Rob Blatt is that character, but um, Wilbur Tennant is also that character. And there, Wilbur is sort of one of the instigating characters that starts the story in motion, who is also in his own way, very differently from Rob, confronting the limitations of the individual fighting powerful forces. So just from a creative perspective, I think that is where we wanted the script to get kind of more deeper is the people in the fight against enormously powerful institutions, what is the price they pay? You know, it's so timely for this film to be coming out now. Um, and I, is there a playbook in this film that maybe could be applied to <laughs> whistleblowers <laughs> on the national stage? <laughs> <laughs> worth it it's worth it to blow the whistle but that you know it's it's their lives are different because of it for well, sure well the david and goliath aspect of it you know i think is is actually quite appealing because we as little people sometimes don't think that we have the ability to create this kind of change against these large power structures but we do and that and it, i think it always starts there um and I think what's remarkable about, about Rob is he's, he's, not, he's, not a, he's not your typical hero. He's, he's a very modest guy. And, um, and, and, and we really went for that in it. 
He's not a hero because we want to be him. He's a hero because we don't. You know, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a really lonely journey in a, in, a, in a culture where everything's telling you to go for the money, the career, the car, the bigger house. This guy takes another journey in the midst of all that, right at the beginning of all that. He's just made partner, and he takes another journey, which has a, was spiritual in nature. And it's one that's driven by justice. And that... It, that's what we have to like celebrate today because there's a, something so much more fulfilling in that for him, even though it's difficult. You could see it's his destiny, it's his, it's his calling, and that's what kept him going even as it became difficult. Yeah, I think the interiority of the character that you're able to explore really adds a beautiful emotional dimension to a whistleblower story that you think has certain beats, but it becomes a much deeper journey. Um, you know, I know that this, you started shooting on January 14th, 2019, Cincinnati, a place that Killer has made five films or four other films before. Um, I want to actually insert a question from the audience, uh, which is from Lindsay. Uh, the question is, tackling films inspired by true offense always adds an extra challenge. How was your team successful? What hardships did you face? Uh, Cincinnati and the bitter cold. Uh, schedule of your talent. Uh, what sort of parts of the process would you keep? And would you do anything differently? That's for, for all of you. I mean, you know, Killer is no stranger to true life stories. We were known for, for more than one. Um, I mean, I think there's certainly a, you know, a sense of responsibility, especially, I mean, Rob was on our set most of the time, right? I mean, right. really, he was around. And when he wasn't there, there was often Todd saying, call Rob to find out, like, if he stacked his legal pads on top of each other or if he spread them out on the desk. But seriously, that kind of, those sort of questions which lent a kind of, you know, an authenticity to the, to the process, which I think was really important to everybody. In terms of challenges, um, winter in Cincinnati was definitely one of them, just pragmatically. Yeah. Um, it never ended. I think, <laughs> I think we, in retrospect, looked back and every single time we were exterior, we maybe couldn't go to our exterior sets and had to go to cover set. Um, deep freeze, I think we all learned there's a new rule, which is you can't work outside under a certain temperature and you have to go to cover just for cold. Um, we shot on a real farm, and there were all sorts of challenges with that, but it, it, I, I do think it, it, lent, um, it lent some rigor to the storytelling, uh, being up against the elements. I would say also um, in the developing of the script, you know, the one thing I think we've done really nicely is to, um, is to, is to center on community, or at least have communi the community have a voice and, and have fleshed out characters in it. And those are real people and that's really their life. And, um, you know, balancing that and, and making sure that that's honest. And, you know, we actually use the community in the movie. Um, and that could be really scary for a production, I think. How so? How are they used? Well, you know, the thing about these kinds of, uh, when you're in a community that's, that's fighting on this level, eventually a lot of infighting starts to happen as well. Um, and so it's, it's hard to keep the community together because they're under so much stress. And it lasted so long, we're talking 17 years. And so people expect things to happen quicker, they want, um, they want the, they want justice sooner. They want justice more fully. They, they, they want to see people hung. Um, and you could understand why. But you, you have a lot of voices and a lot of really strong feelings and opinions. And Todd just did this beautiful job with Killer and, and our writer, Mario Carrere, of, of making sure that, that all of those disparate viewpoints and, and, um, and opinions 
were honored in a way that they could all come into the picture and all feel taken care of. And, and that's, a, that's a remarkable feat in this kind of space, people living under this kind of pressure. You know, that actually leads, um, thanks for the soft lob, to my next question, which is about the visual vocabulary that was established with this film. And um, can you all speak about the, the kind of concert conversations and contributions, particularly from Hannah Beachler, your production designer, who I know her work from Black Panther and Food Fail Station, and Ed Lockman as the, the DP, um, kind of how they, their contribution to the vocabulary of the film. Well, I'll start a little bit with Ed, just that, you know, the challenge for him uh, and for Todd was to take a film that takes place largely in conference rooms, offices, you know, suburban living rooms, and make that visually stunning, which uh, they absolutely did. Um, and these know, are real life locations with the office, right? The office, what, it was the real, the real Taft offices. Uh, I mean, you, as you said, this was the fifth time we shot in Cincinnati. It was the only time that we didn't have to hide Cincinnati. You know, so it was kind of great to be able to be like, there's Fountain Square, you know, that's okay. Uh, so, um, but yes, a lot of the locations were, you know, at least some of them were the real locations. And Hannah, um, you know, she came in to meet uh, just generally with me and Christine. I think you were there. And she is from Cincinnati and she grew up on a farm and I know I, I think what she and Todd really found in, in their language together was just an extraordinary level of detail and authenticity and really, you know, dignifying all the spaces that it wasn't just Taft Law Firm and it wasn't just courtrooms, it was the farm and the farmhouse and it was the, you know, the, the Kiger's home and the churches to just provide a lot of texture and, and authenticity and dignity to the people who were the victims of what was going on, not just um, Rob's world, but to, to toggle between these two realities. Um, she came in with this incredible presentation of photographs and references, um, which is how Todd likes to work. He always has this incredible lookbook that telegraphs to everyone, this is the, this is the look and feel of what I'm going for, and uh, sticks to it. And wasn't she campaigning at the same time? Yeah, she how, won. Uh, yeah. For, so how, how do you balance, how did she balance, how did the team balance her campaigning for her incredible win um, for Black Panther and being in Cincinnati and sounds like boot camp to get this done? Yeah, you know, there's the, the flight on Friday night and there's the Sunday flight back, which she did a number of times. Um, and an amazing, amazing crew, too. Yeah, right. They just jumped in whenever they needed to. So um, this film, I think, is is a beginning of a conversation um, that you don't want to end when it finishes. Um, Mark, can you speak to the the call to action and you know, kind of what people can do after seeing this film? So, I mean, one of the great things about working with participant is that um, they don't just kind of leave you with the film. That, you know, there's a, there's a big advocacy campaign that to me is as important as, as any other part of all of this. And um, so there's a, there's a website, um, www.foreverchemicals.com. Um, uh, and uh, from there, uh, there'll be We've created a coalition of all of the communities in the United States that are fighting against PFOA. I mean, just to give you an example, in California, the Environmental Working Group just found that 70 water districts in California are polluted with PFOA, and that's 7 million people's drinking water, and they just found out about it like two weeks ago. Um, this is happening throughout the entire United States. It's all over the world. There's a world movement growing. We just met with uh, some of our um, contemporaries in Europe um, about advocacy and how we're going to how we're going to deal with this. And so, uh, out of uh, ForeverChemicals.com, there will be several um, campaigns going on, uh, legislative, 
uh, on federal legislation, uh, local, local legislation, uh, state legislation, which is actually much more effective than federal on these issues, and, um, and getting um, materials and social media might to the frontline communities who, who are doing this for nothing. They're fighting for their lives, and they stretch a dollar into $10,000. And so the more we can support them, uh, the, the, the better and quicker and more efficiently these problems will be dealt with. But it's, it's global, and we all have it in us. We all have PFOA in us, and it builds in us, and there's no way of getting rid of it. And that's why it's called a forever chemical. And, and Lisa, you, um, you sort of led with this, the quip that we finished the movie October 22nd, and, and, and it's going to be released a month later. And Christine and I were sort of in the weeds of the finishing of the movie, and like, what if we need more time? we got to let the movie have its time. And we were reminded there's no time because people need to know the story. And it was really profound to think about a narrative. We're used to making our films and, and leading with their stories, but this also has this layer of, of relevance to humanity that really played into the, the, the experience. Um, so just wanted to Absolutely. The, the clock is, is, is uh, is ticking, it's, and it's actually sp picking up speed. Uh, I was so excited that I got to see this, and I would ask everyone here to see and spread the word, and November 22nd to turn out. Um, and uh, please join me in thanking Pam, Christine, and Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, they bring me out here for the sad news because sad news is that was the last master class. We have another session. That was our last master class. So I want to actually take this uh, time to say thank you. A big thank you to all the master class session speakers and the moderators. I hope you've been having a really informative day. And, you know, I'm that guy. I urged you er earlier to meet some people. Well, some people didn't listen to me. So, I want you all to stand up. What? You bet me, stand up. Body Language 101. For this next great session, the future of producing, I want you all, that's right, put your arms back, your shoulders back, take a deep breath. Meet the person on your left and meet the person on your right, right now. Stay tight. <laughs> Say hello. I'm a producer and I care about you. Exchange cards or tap phones together. Exchange numbers. Guys, this is when you network. Okay. Okay. Now I got to bring you back home. Take your seats. Very well done. Okay. Take your seats. That's well done. Thank you. Yep. Okay. I need your attention again. It's hard to create chaos and then calm the chaos down. Well done, guys. You at least have two new contacts that I'm absolutely certain about. There is more time for this, though, guys. Right after this session, okay, I got to have your attention now, please. Thank you. It's not done. Purpose of this conference is to inform and educate some of the brightest producers and talent and crew in the business. But it also is 
For the next hour and a half, it's our networking party after this session. Next hour, hour and a half is our networking party, okay? Please don't take off. Please stick around. This is when, again, if you are, it's not easy, guys, to go up this range, even for me, and then you probably think, oh, I'm a, I'm a fool, I'll talk to anybody. I won't, it's hard. So this is the excuse I give everyone, and it really works. Just say, Vance told me to meet you. <laughs> it's automatic, it's easy, it's not your fault. I want you to meet people. This is where you guys are all producers. We're all, we're all in this great business together. So please stick around for, and, and do some more networking. Okay, I'm really honored to introduce the last session, which is called The Future of Producing. Uh, it's a wonderful discussion about what's really, uh, you guys are facing of very hard obstacles out there. We're trying to make it easier in any way we can. And to lead us through this discussion, I'm really honored and I'm happy to um, introduce to you the President Emeritus of the Guild, former President of the Guild, wonderful person who really deeply cares about all of you and all about producing, Lori McCreary. Thank you. Thank you, Vance. Hello, everyone. Um, let me get right to welcoming our speakers. Elaine Frontaine Bryant. Elaine is A&E Network's EVP and Head of Programming. She oversees all the cable network's nonfiction slate, and she's known for having spearheaded trailblazing content such as Leia Remini's Scientology and the Aftermath, Born This Way, and The Clinton Affair. Elaine was a former History Channel SVP of Development and Programming, and listen up, all you indie doc and film producers. She is now also heading up the indie doc and film division of a &E. Welcome, Elaine. <laughs> Next up is Dan Lin. He's founder and CEO of Rideback, a film and television company known for producing major tent, fil tent poll content for global audiences, in addition to producing recent blockbusters such as the Lego Movie franchise, Aladdin, the It franchise. He also recently produced the soon to be released The Two Popes for Netflix. Thank you, Dan, for finding the time to be here. Next up is Banks Tarver. He's co-founder and co-president of Left Right, which has been specializing in an eclectic mix of nonfiction television, and they're now also developing for scripted. His EP credit span shows like This American Life, the Circus, and the critically acclaimed New York Times produced The Weekly for FX, which airs the next day on Hulu, or streams the next day, I should say. Um, Banks's prior career was a civil rights attorney. So welcome, Banks. And Nina Yang Bon Jovi is co-founder of Significant Productions, having produced a number of award-winning features like Fruitville Station, Sorry to Bother You, along with her producing partner Forrest Whitaker. She's recently added television to their roster with Godfather of Harlem, which is currently on Epics. Don't miss it. <laughs> Nina just finished day five of production on her latest feature. They're shooting in New York called Passing, so we really appreciate you being here on your day six. <laughs> so, you may have noticed that everyone up here is developing, producing, or buying entertainment across myriad of different formats. And they've been doing it successfully, so I'm honored to have you all here to help us understand how you've been able to navigate this crazy moving landscape that is called producing these days. Before we start, I just, we were talking earlier and I thought we would love to just look and see out here in the audience. Can I get a raise of hands? How many of you work in feature films, either indie or tent poles or animation? Could you raise your hand? Okay, that's a lot, that's probably Half or a third? How many of you are in scripted? Streaming, network, or cable series? And how about unscripted? Okay, that's a lot too. And what about other formats? Short form, animated shorts, new media? Okay, now the million dollar question. Are any of you doing multiple formats? How many of you are doing multiple formats? Holy moly, okay. So this is, this is a good conversation for all of us. All of us are working in multiple formats, and I want to um, first ask, how large are your development slates these days, and how do you navigate the different formats in your company? Who would like to start? 
Okay, I'll start. Nina. <laughs> um, we, our, our slate is never large, given the fact that Forrest and I have only a certain amount of bandwidth. So when it comes to our development slate, it's, um, I say on average, 10. But, but all 10 projects are, are projects that we love and that we feel that needs to be told. Um, in the TV space, uh, we have a first look deal with Amazon Studios. So TV space, um, we have probably, I say five currently, you know, that we're developing, but more. But I'm seeking more and more by collaborating with filmmakers, creators, storytellers. So, so it does, you know, it's so pretty small. So you have five, and of the ten are are TV. No, or you have ten, ten, features? ten features, and then and that's then not, that's not so little. No, it's not big. <laughs> but then also we have our studio films that's already set up, and then the independent films that we're grinding it out, trying to get it made. Exactly, so. and you're working on an independent film yes. now? Yes, How's that going? It's hard, it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> and Banks, how about you, how's your? Um, well, first off, I'd like to say that because my company does primarily nonfiction work, that I'm, we're probably different from most of the other company owners uh, or companies represented on the stage. So in the nonfiction world, we have I mean, at least 50, probably 70 projects, but that could be just a great idea, a magazine article we like and want to investigate. Um, but our trick is always to, of the 50 to 75 projects that are alive, trying to figure out the ones that make the most sense to really make a bet on and spend some money on. But part of the real fun of what we do is that everything is conceivably an idea that we could explore and and try to develop. So that part of the business is really fun because it's a, I wouldn't say it's a volume business, but we always have to have a bunch of stuff going on because the odds are just not great <laughs> on any one project. So. And if you have 50, how do you manage the time? Are you moving all 50 forward a little or do you? Yeah, well, we have a development team, which I think is how most nonfiction companies work. Um, and just to sort of clarify how I first learned what it was to be a scripted producer. Um, in the nonfiction game, we work with the development team to develop ideas and get them ready to pitch. We go out and pitch, and usually we don't, you know, I'm the creative voice in the room that's doing the pitch, that's talking about the idea, that's answering questions. And when we've done it on the scripted side, people do not care at all who I am or don't want to ask me a single question because it's really about the writer and these kinds of producers who do this work all the time. Um, but we have a development team to answer your question of five to six people and then we have showrunners with whom we have overall deals and they also participate in the development process. So it's, you know, we're we meet every week to talk about progress on the various ideas and they identify the ones that are higher priority. So at Rideback, I would say we have a relatively large slate, uh, but it's because we're kind of a mini studio and we are in film, television, animation. Um, we're also doing a little bit in the short docu format. So just from seeing what all the hands that were raised, I think now as a producer, it's important to tell someone's story and be able to tell it in different forms. And so we, we, we have a relatively large slate as a result of that. But I think the goal for us is that we want to tell every story that we actually develop so we don't take on anything that we don't think we have a high chance of getting made. I'm gonna echo that. Um, we, I, I think we only, I cannot, I didn't count before I came here today, but I can't imagine we have anything um, higher than 50. And you know, A&E is a nonfiction brand, but it is a very diverse brand. So we do live programming, and we do sort of high-end premium docs, and we do long-running series, and we do sort of formatted shows. And so within that, you know, we try to keep the development spread out so that we're always having something kind of bubbling up in each of these areas. And so um, I'd say it's somewhere between 40 and 50. Wow, okay. Um, Nina, you um, are just working on the passing. Can you tell us how that went from on your development slate to a green light? Well, Passing, passing is um, a film that's based on the novel by Nella Larson with the same title. And it's about two black women who pass as whites in the 1920s. And um, the toughest part of getting that film to where we are today in production is the fact that it's a period piece. It stars people of color, and we're shooting it in black and white. 
So, so really, everything that I can, didn't know that part. Yeah, everything oh that goodness. could go against us was against us. Um, Rebecca Hall is our writer director, first time feature filmmaker. That was another mark against us. So, um, but if you know some of the films that we've done, we've been challenged on every level about its worth because we champion you know stories that reflect culture, race, and and identity and want to create dialogue. So um, Rebecca's, she wrote it 12 years ago. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So when it came to me and Forrest, um, only about a year ago, that's where she almost gave up. And, um, and I met her, found out her background. Um, she's actually mixed race, which is very um, insightful why she wants to do this film. And... Um, and we went through, so I go to my investors to, to raise the money for it. But what happens is when you do a film starring people of color and stories like the ones we do, um, there's no, we're always told there's no international worth or value. So you just have to go to trusted um, investment parties that believe in culture shifts, you know, telling multicultural st stories, and hopefully create social impact. So it took a while for us to get here. That's a long while. That's really inspiring. So all of you who have projects in development for 12, 10, I've had stuff for 20, don't fret. At some point, your time will come. Uh, my motto is every project has its time and its team. You just might not have the right one yet. So that's really inspiring. Um, We've been talking about looking at our slates and the evolving uh, landscape. Dan, you've mastered storytelling in this big world of tent poles. Can you tell us a little bit about the journey of the two popes and how you made that um, work on a streaming network? Yeah, the story with the two popes is really interesting because it's, it's both uh, vision and happen happenstance. And so we had um, made the Lego movie and we feel like we tried to do our spin on an animated movie. And we had made uh, It, which is our spin on a horror movie. And we talked about what's like the next genre we can tackle with our fresh approach to it. And I'd been obsessed with uh, Pope Francis and how he was you know, doing a tour around the world and essentially a, a rock star pope. And trying to figure out what's a new way to tell the story of the pope that wasn't a traditional biopic. And uh, actually I had dinner with my, my attorney and I said, he asked me, what do you want to do next? And I said, well, it sounds, it's going to sound weird, David, but I want to make a movie on the pope. And he said, that's so strange. I have my other client, Anthony McCartan. I just read a play of his called The Pope. And it's like this small little play, kind of the Frost-Nixon version of that between the current Pope Francis and the previous Pope Benedict. So he arranged a meeting, and I met with Anthony. And we talked, and we talked about how we can expand his play into a bigger movie. And then we talked about who our dream director would be. And given Pope Francis' background in Latin America, we said, oh, it'd be amazing to get a Latin American filmmaker and one of my favorite movies is uh, City of God. So I reached out to Fernando Moraes, and lo and behold, he was interested in doing it. So that's kind of how it started. Then we attached him. We went out to the different studios, uh, and it had interest in several studios. But Netflix, I think, was most passionate about it. Right in the room, uh, they bought it and said, you know, we had a really good feeling. We talked about earlier about, you know, how big our development slates are. But with Netflix, they make almost everything they develop. And so they came in saying, okay, guys, I know other studios want to buy this, but we're telling you, we're going to make this. And so we committed to Netflix um, as our, our distributor. Bravo. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. With um, the plethora of new apps, new distribution platforms, it's really hard to, for an audience to find where most content is. I mean, sometimes it's hard for me to know where stuff I've made is. I have to kind of go on to four or five different apps. Um, when, when we're making such volumes of content at such an unprecedented rate, um, how do we make our project stand out? I'd love to hear from each of you. And maybe, Elaine, we can start with, you found a way to win, a, win the night, I think on Friday and maybe even Saturday nights at A&E, um, called Live TV. Can you speak to us Live about that? Live PD. It's, what's it called? PD. PD. Like Live PD. Yeah. Right. So um, what we were doing was uh, figuring out, you know, it, frankly, it was a development step. I was just telling Dan this in, in the room before. It was a under a hundred thousand dollar development step where somebody brought the concept to me of um sort of like a red zone for um covering 
policing in America with a you know credited journalist slash uh, lawyer that could maybe be there and we could cut to the different cities to see what's going on. And I didn't even know technologically how that could possibly be happen. How do you have three feeds from eight cities coming in and transmitted and hosted and you know discussed? Um, th the development came in at you know at a time when it was a big conversation going on in our country, and then I thought, uh, 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 will the will the um, will the departments even want to participate um, in this? And then also, will my bosses even want to keep going, even when the development came in and they proved that they had the access? Yes, the departments did. Yes, um, uh, you know. My, you know, my, the bosses above me were brave enough to keep going live with policing live um, from eight different cities. We started out on a Friday night when we realized that there was um, a kind of a white space in the, you know, we were only doing repeats. That's my challenge. So everybody, you know, when you see Scott and you hear what Dan's doing, you know, it's like, uh, who wouldn't want to be on Netflix on Friday night, you know, or on their DVRs, right? So it's like, how do we keep people? So let's try to program with something exciting on that night because repeats weren't happening, working for us anymore. And so we launched with a two hour episode and um, it you know, slowly got attention and traction over maybe three or four weeks. We saw some signs of life. Then we added a third hour because the social interactions that were happening from the people watching the show were unbelievable. I had never seen anything like this on Twitter. And they were just coming home on Friday nights, and this was their Friday night. And then we added Saturday night, and I'm very sorry and thankful to the amazing team uh, that work these weekends. Um, and now we have a few of them, so they rotate, and they do get some time with their families. But um, so now it is six hours a week that we have. Um, the show repeats. It is cut down and is syndicated. It's kind of remarkable. I was telling Dan, it's like the number one DVR show of the last couple of years, too. You can actually look that up. It's, so live it's and people watching. Live and dvr So um, that's one way for us. Um, all we were doing is what has worked in the past and how might we big it up in some way that feels like a progressive way that says something about the country that we're in. And, and it's worked. That's fantastic. It's like it's, appointment television. Yeah, but it's interesting hearing, because Elaine and I were talking, my roommate in college loved watching cops in college <laughs> on Friday night, and he didn't go out. And Elaine changed the format of cops. So it's something, a format you're familiar with, but how do you change it? How do you make it interesting? How do you make it must-see? Uh, I think that's really important. We're talking about you know, everyone's excited to be on Netflix or on streaming, but there is so much content out there and you have to figure out how to break out. So even with us, with the two popes, we, we said, okay, we're gonna be on Netflix, but how do we be noisy? How do we get people to pay attention? I'm excited for you guys to see the movie, but when you guys see it, it's not gonna be the movie that you expect. It's, it's much funnier. You know, we use The Odd Couple as an example. The use of mu music is really interesting. Um, what Fernando did with the music, um, what he did with flashbacks, it's uh, in a foreign language uh, as well as in English. So trying lots of different things. So there's a lot of talk about there's a golden age of streaming and it is, but you also think about your content and how do you break out uh, once you're on a streaming network. That's right, and how do you get people talking about it, which it sounds like what both of you are doing. That's quite interesting. Uh, well, on my end, I can speak a little bit on Godfather Harlem because Epix is like a new kind of a newer network and, and they have an app. So I think that was a big challenge mm. that internally we all talked about saying, how do we get people to watch Godfather of Harlem? There's different levels of, of trying to figure it out of how do we appeal to a younger demographic? And we use that um, with the music elements in Godfather of Harlem where we were so fortunate to get Swiss Beats to create the entire soundtrack for us and he reached out to all these Wait, other Wait, can you stop and tell us how you did that? <laughs> <laughs> so that, that was a strategic move on the marketing aspect and then uh, what I find whether it was film or TV is you gotta have the right marketing team and marketing department that understand what you're telling thoroughly and they have to be on point because it could kill a film or kill a TV series. You have the wrong marketing team on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. Um, not to sound coy or worse, dumb. Um, <laughs> I, 
I think we've operated in sort of a funny way. We're like an old-fashioned documentary company that just happened to have been formed at the time that all this great TV opportunity came up. And I think we tend, even though we have a large number of items on the slate, we tend to think about the ones we were most interested in. So we do very little. It's not planned, but we do very little. Let's really think about what would fit here, what, would, what it needs to break through at this place. We just start with the ideas and keep playing around with them until they turn into something we like. And then when we're ready to take them out, we may have that conversation about, you know, get some intel about Netflix and then try to go in there smart. But, hmm. yeah. Have any of you had something that started out in one format and then morphed into something else? Yeah, we, the, one of our very few scripted shows started as a nonfiction piece, and that was at um, Bravo. We made this scripted comedy called Odd Mom Out, and the performer, writer, uh, we were introduced to, and she was, uh, it was gonna be a nonfiction thing. And the more we worked with her, we saw how lovely she was and how good on camera she was. So we ended up sort of, because we were trying to break in two scripted, we decided the best way for us to get there would be to make tapes because we do that really well. And so we invested in and just made a scripted, it was essentially a 15 minute tape, but scripted with her that we then shared with the network and that turned it into a scripted half hour comedy. Is that, was that your first foray into scripted? That was, we were sort of reaching into that world at that time. That was probably the first one that got approved, yeah, that we saw. We're also the other benefit of nonfiction is that we're quite comfortable working with less money. And so there was a point when, and it's really? happened on every script, <laughs> except with you. That's good to know. Yeah. Um, but every time we've sold a scripted project, the network will finally decide they want to do it. And rather than celebrate, they, we then are asked to do a budget that they can then share with their internal studio to see if they can beat the numbers. Um, but they haven't been able to just because we're used to making shows for less money. So, oh. yeah. I had an experience that, that might be interesting is because um, TV is such a science, the way how scripted television is. And um, about a, a, early this year, Forrest and I and the team went to pitch a Asian American um, story that was genre and went to everywhere and everybody didn't believe in it saying it's too challenging so instead of going TV I ended up now going after the book rights and making now I'm developing it as a feature mm -hmm. just to do the feature first because I believe in it so much that once I make the feature I'll go back to television with it and they'll be begging <laughs> for it I guarantee and I think Sometimes that can work in documentary to too I think documentary can be an exceptional breeding ground then for a series that can happen too. Yeah. Can you say the first part of that again? You th I think that can work in documentary too. I think documentaries can be a very fertile breeding ground for ongoing series too and nonfiction. Yeah. It's exciting. It's, it's, a, it's a great Thanks time, I think, for all of us. Um, has the dominance of streamers, um, I, I, I talk often about the middle class of films kind of like for independent filmmakers falling apart, Million Dollar Baby, Shawshank Redemption, all those films would have a hard time finding um, what we would consider you know, a theatrical release these days, but they would find more room on streamers. Is that influencing how you're looking at your slates these days? Um, it requires a diversity of developing your slate. You know, certainly, as you guys know, with films these days, studios want branded IP. Uh, they want someone, even if it's not a branded IP, something that has a built-in fan base. So the middle middle budget films are just harder to get made. But I think it's all about finding an audience for your movie. And so even with like, for instance, with Pope Francis, he has 1.2 billion followers. So um, there's <laughs> even a nice way, audience. <laughs> yes, there's a way to eventize even for a mid-budget or lower um, budget film. So for me, it's about how do you get people again. Elaine was talking about on Friday night, how do you get people to watch? You know, how do you get them, in, in, with Elaine getting them to watch her show, for me it's how do you get people to go to the box office? And so even in a lower budget uh, film, it's about what is it that's exciting, that's new, that forces you to want to get out and buy a ticket? Mm. Uh, from, from my end, I think the independent film space has changed so much, it's kind of frightening for me because 
you know, in 2013, we launched Fruitvale Station. That was still a great time for independent filmmaking. And then from then cut to 2018, when we were launching Sorry to Bother You, it's drastically changed because of the streamers and, and um, buyers in the marketplace being very fearful of independent film. And, and also Amazon purchased some, some big deals and that failed. So, so I think there's a cooling effect with acquisitions on independent film um, where I'm frightened for, for emerging producers because it's so hard to raise independent money to make your film. And if the acquisition is less, it, it has lessened, that hurts the prospects of your, your features. So that's one of my fears is for independent producers um, in the process of raising money. It's become t like way tougher than it was like five, six years ago. You know, I'm kind of speaking like uh, a little more on what Dan was saying even before. It's like the, if not known IP, you know, like our Leah Remini Scientology in the Aftermath series. Um, Alex Gibney broke that ground with HBO, right, and going clear, and that was the Trojan horse that we knew that people were interested in this. It was, it was a, it was a world that p the stories were crazy. There was a world that people were interested in. So we didn't have Lawrence Wright, we didn't have Alex Gibney, Leah Remini is sort of an every woman face, which is perfect for my middle America kind of audience that what came, came along and was perfect for Scientology and that just added to that. But there was a known IP in something like that. We have another series that is set in um, jails where innocent people go undercover uh, for a specific reason, but really at the behest of the sheriff to try to fix a problem. And for me, I was interested, I knew that there was a conversation in the country about the penal system and what it was like and could it be made better, but really jail shows work. So how do you, you know, how do you get something that, oh great, it's a, it's a bigger discourse, but also it's not a known IP, but it's something that I know can work in a new way so that it was like somebody like me is gonna go into jail for 60 days. It, it totally game changed what something that had worked for a long time. So. It, I'm not answering specifically to what you're thinking, but in, in, a, in the space as you innovate as producers, things that if it's not a known IP like a book or even a name or a, you know, a, an author that everyone knows, knowing that there's an interest in something and then turning it on its head in a way that makes it feel very fresh takes it a lot further for us and it's a lot easier because we know that there's real interest there. I think what you're hearing from all of us is it's all a gamble and it's a case-by-case -case basis and it's hard to say a blanket statement, do you go theatrical, do you go streaming? You really have to look on a case-by-case -case basis and, and weigh, is your project uh, noisy enough that you, you want to bet on getting a theatrical release? Or as Scott talked about earlier, do you want to be in 190 countries uh, around the world day and date? You know, so that you always have to balance it and look at the property that you have and what's the, what's the bet that you want to take? Yeah, that's, that's quite interesting. I love the idea of looking at um, entertainment and your story and then figuring at, it out um, along the way where, you, where the most people will be able to see it. Um, Elaine, um, how do you, so in the past, we used to be able to see um, Nielsen ratings and used to be able to know on the other channels how you were doing, how your cable um, channel was doing against others with the streamers, has that changed the way you f try to figure out what your programming is and what your slate is? Well, and, and uh, you know, not for me, unfortunately. Like, I'm waiting for them to catch up with the same metrics <laughs> because, you know, every day at 4.15, I know my report card, you know? It's like, right. tell it to my little 12-year-old who's like, I don't wanna have a report card. And I'm like, I get one every day. But um, I don't know what their metric, I really don't know what their metrics are. And it's fascinating because, it plays into negotiations in season twos. It, right, your producers, it's like, wow, we know what this show means to you. Um, and it's a conversation. And um, talent, you know, nonfiction talent can be the same, you know, kind of negotiation as scripted talent. I mean, we're not paying friends rates, <laughs> but it's that kind of thing when they know that there's a success. With, if the streamers don't release the, kind of the metrics to tell you that, I don't know how you, ha, you know, have that kind of, it's a, it seems like it's, I don't work there, but it seems like it's not the balance in the producers, you know, 
It's, that's all. I'm going to stop there. <laughs> well, I think it'd be great for us to have data. I think, I mean, we get the data if we have a network show, if we have a theatrical that goes out, we see box office numbers. The question is, in the future, how are we going to judge how our product is doing out in the marketplace when it's on a network or a streamer that isn't giving us feedback like that? And I think that's the conversation we want to start having in the industry as a whole. How do we work together with the distributors to make sure so that we can all you know, look at our, at our projects and make sure that we're moving things forward in a way that we know people want to see? Because right, we want to make product that people want to see, and we know there's an audience for that. So. I think we can clearly say we would love data if there's any streamers out there. Um, we have an audience question asking, um, have any of you uh, delved yet into short form content and what's been your experience? Elaine, I think you said you cut down the live PDs into smaller... Yeah, we go from three hours to a one hour cut down and then it goes to a 30 minute show called Police Patrol that then is syndicated um, so in you're a lot of places. It the other way from up. And we also, you know, we have a, a strand that we've brought back, and Banks has been a big part of that, um, the biography strand. Ah. And those are films that are two-hour films, six-hour films at times, four-hour films, depending on what the subject is. But sometimes we'll cut a little segment of that called a bio bite. I didn't name it, but it's cute. And it's, you know, like literally a three minute of that. Or sometimes they're produced in-house that work around a week. Like we have a big Garth Brooks biography coming soon. So the week of Garth Brooks, we'll have our own little produced bio bites of other um, people. Literally three minutes. I'm not doing that, but somebody else is doing that linearly um, that sales likes. You know, a lot of my programming is not sales friendly. So they like it when there is sales friendly programming. So uh, that's good. We're trying for the first time. Um, we are doing a short film series with the Nobel Institute, and they came to us a few years ago and said, we need help telling our story, that we want to be the Oscars of academia, but that uh, we're becoming less and less relevant uh, in this day and age. And so we sent a particular creative team together, uh, went out to Stockholm, and talked to them about their stories. And they really have a history of, of amazing stories and organizations that they've supported. And one of the filmmakers that we brought out there was Orlando von Isidel, who uh, won an Oscar for his docu-short, um, White Helmets. And so they commissioned a short film series. So we shot five uh, short films highlighting organizations that the Nobel Institute supports. And one of those short films is being released called Lost and Found uh, that highlights the Rohingya crisis. And so then we shot the short film series. Uh, Nat Geo bought uh, several of the shorts. And so that, that'll be released through Nat Geo and it's going through the festival circuit now. Great. But I think it's just an example of what we talked about earlier. Is just, if you have a story to tell, you just gotta figure out which, what, which format is it in. Because this is, I'd never done non-scripted before and it's just, with the right story, you just have to figure out what's, what's the format that that story wants to be told in. Yeah, we really don't do much. Most of the networks, when they commission a series from us, like the circus, they'll ask us to provide clips either before the episode is aired or right after. And we have fun making those, but we haven't really developed much specifically. I would say for short form, short form for me means, you know, three to five minutes as opposed to a half an hour show. Yeah. From our end, we don't develop short film at this point, but I do watch short films from filmmakers to see if the filmmaker is a storyteller and um, sometimes you get an opportunity where you could adapt a short film into a feature length feature um, film. So short film is like such a great calling card for filmmakers. I would agree, I would agree. Um, another audience question, given the change in the industry in terms of agencies and writers, how are you sourcing writers and are, do you have any tips for us? Maybe Dan and Nina. Um, how are we sourcing writers? We're sourcing writers through managers, but also through other writers. Uh, I love what Vance said earlier about what to do after this panel. I think the most important part tonight is probably the social hour. You know, how do you connect with other producers? And, and now, a lot of it now is a lot of it is word of mouth. And actually, it's sometimes I think it's really effective because we ask other writers that we work with, okay, here is the assignment, here is the project we need help on. Do you know either, are you interested? If you're not interested, who are uh, collaborators you know that you know us well, you know the writers community well, who are the uh, right writers for that? So we've relied even more on the community and, and word of mouth, and I think it's even important for you guys as producers uh, to have that, that sense of community. 
Yeah, I, I do agree with Dan on my end, uh, working with managers uh, who recommend certain writers to me. But from most of the stuff that I have put in development are from writers that I've admired from afar and then have met them and then kept in touch. And when something I feel is right for that particular writer or writing team, I just talk to them, ask them if they're interested. If they are, I end up negotiating the... Um, writer's agreement with their manager and their attorney. So given the fact that the agency right now are in conflict with WGA, it becomes, it's a little bit, um, it takes a little bit longer. So, so um, but it doesn't make me stop. I think it's actually building those relationships with writers is the key. And then those writers could say, you know, you should meet my other fellow writers. So it definitely is a networking um, situation. Um, have you guys ever, have any of you worked on the w, with the WJ portal? So if you, if you don't know about this, you can actually email a particular writer that you might know their work or you want, have, want to get in touch with them, and you can email the, to the WGA portal what your project is and that you're interested in working with them. WGA will connect you with that writer. Now, it's that writer's prerogative to connect back with you or not, but it's a really good way. I actually have gotten to a couple writers that I had been trying to for a little while, um, and I was able to get through to them through the WJ portal, so that's a really good way. And why don't, is, are there any writers or writer producers in the room? Were you raise your hand? Okay, everyone look around. Writer, 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 right. Lots of writers here. That's fantastic. Okay, so at, the, at five o'clock when we break for the networking, make sure you guys all meet each other, because whoever asked that question, there's a lot of writers in the room. What's interesting is I see a lot of my friends who are writers in television, they do the hashtag WGA Writers Boost, and it's pretty incredible when they're staffing up and you see all the people pitching them on Twitter. It's awesome. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Okay, also Twitter. What's the hashtag again? I think it's WGA Writers Boost. Okay, WGA Writers Boost. Um, Staffing Boost, yeah. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about the global um, audience and the market. It, we're, we're global now. I mean, originally when I was first starting in film, you know, 80% of your budget was coming from domestic and 20% was from foreign, and now it's completely the opposite. We're lucky if we get 20% from domestic, especially on our independent films. Yeah. Um, and on the films that don't travel, so to speak, it's even, it's even rougher. So, I mean, Dan, you have a first look at Warner Brothers. Um, Nina, you just recently closed a deal with Amazon. For television. For TV, yeah. okay. I mean, A&E competes on the global stage all over the place, and Banks here with WME, and they have this big uh, Red Arrow Studios, which is all over the planet. What are the tangible ways that looking at the world as a global market, how do they affect what you're doing in terms of programming or developing? I feel like you're looking at me. Yeah. Uh, no, no. <laughs> I think you have to look at stories that have universal appeal. Uh, with the case of Aladdin, we made a movie that was, was the most diverse cast of any big Disney event movie. Um, but it was huge in Japan and it was huge in Korea. Uh, and not something that we immediately expected, but when we talked to those markets afterwards about what was it that resonated, they talked about um, the, the song Speechless. And it was an anthem uh, for the women in Japan and Korea. And you saw the, these theaters full of women rewatching the movie because how strong they felt, uh, how strongly they felt about Naomi Scott's performance. So I think it's looking at um, issues that are important to you and doing it in an entertaining way and realizing that if it's important to you, it probably will tell a story globally, it will resonate globally. I, for, mm -hmm. for me, as a commissioner domestically, it's. It's really uh, all about it being here. And we tend to um, commission worldwide rights. It, it's always a conversation, in particular in the big docs, like the biography docs, not every, like we're doing a lot of country music and we're doing wrestler biographies. And some of that stuff is not going to travel. And so that's fine with us because we know that our you know international team is fine. But I'm really, I'm kind of doing the opposite. I'm looking for stories that are um, universal within here. You know, they might resonate to the world, but if they don't, that's okay, because, you know, I'm programming for here. Got it. And do you ever sell, do you ever buy product just um, domestically and allow producers to keep the rest of the world? Yes, it's, do, it, it's a case-by-case -case basis. It doesn't happen very often, but um, we do. Great. Yeah, it's in nonfiction, again, it's... Um, Unless you're developing like game show formats, 
it's really hard if you're doing a nonfiction doc thing in the United States to sell it abroad. Hmm. So it's, uh, or it, it, the possibility of making enough money is not, um, I mean, the networks are gonna hang on to those rights and it's not worth uh, fighting too hard on those points. We've done it three or four times and it's been great for us when it happens. We just do a license deal domestically and then we're able to make more money on the back end as it's being sold around the world. But in my day to day, that just doesn't happen very often. Yeah. From my end, um, I don't think about the international market because so, so many of our films and stories you wanna tell, uh, the core audience is domestic, mm -hmm. but, um, and then also earlier, as I was saying, we get challenged all the time on the value of our, the films that we produce. But one market that opened it up for us is if our features could get into, say, the Cannes Film Festival, once it gets there, it opens up the world for us. And, and prove that we are worth something and then the sales numbers go up. Um, it's, a, it's still a challenge, but no matter how many films are successful overseas, people say that's an anomaly. Get Out was huge in South Korea, that's an anomaly. You know, so, so it's, just a, it's something that we face uh, annually on every one of our films, so our goal is just make the best damn film possible, mm -hmm. and, then, and then hopefully that will allow it to travel. But one thing I also subscribe to is I don't, when someone wants to give me really no, no, low numbers for certain territories, I just don't sell. You know, it's like, I'm not gonna do it. We're gonna hold, um, I did a, a feature documentary called um, A Kid from Coney Island with Stefan Marbury that um, we launched a few months ago uh, at Tribeca, I only sold the U.S. rights and I kept the Asian rights because I'm going to test case it and what I can do on a sales level on my own and with my core team just to prove the market and figure out those channels for those territories that traditionally that we've been told that they, that our films don't travel. So. It sounds basic, but part of it is that if you want your content, your movie, your TV show to play globally, you have to cast and crew it globally. So with the two popes, that's intentionally why we chose a filmmaker, a director that was from South America, Brazilian. We have crew from Argentina and Italy. I think if you cast and crew your, your, your show or your movie internationally, naturally, uh, I think your content has a better chance of playing universally because they're gonna bring different issues and, and flag things for you that you may not be aware of from your, kind of your domestic point of view. Yeah, going really quickly on what Dan was saying. So cast is absolutely important and and on passing i have i have tessa thompson and ruth nega andre holland but it's still seen as a film starring people of color with little worth and i had to pitch my investors like i have valkyrie in the film and that you know that that's like you have to create those those awareness like she's huge why is why are you saying our film still has no worth? And we have a very small cameo role for a white actor, and the, the whole focus early on was focused on who this white actor will be, white male actor. So it, that's, that's, you know, it's troubling, but it still happens today, so. I, and I believe me, I've been there. I think um, it's so interesting to me because it, I, in this world, whenever I would have a director list and directors of color or, women directors on the list, they, they would inevitably get you know, pushed farther and farther down the list. Today, if I don't have women and people of color on my list, people are shocked and upset. This is a huge, huge win for all of us producers. Yeah. It's a really huge win, and I would just encourage all of you that this is a great time for us. It's still hard. We still haven't broken through um, content everyone's gonna look at, you know, this film didn't break through and this film didn't break through, but it's only because we're just starting to get the, um, the numbers. And once the numbers of films with women and people of color and people of all different, um, from all different parts of the world, once we get the numbers and we start seeing a trend of box office going and streaming numbers going, then it'll be easier. It'll be harder for someone to say, well, they don't travel. That's the common parlance for we don't think it's gonna sell in other parts of the world. Um, but it's exciting to me that we're at this point in, I feel like we're at a point in our business where it's, it's now expected that you're looking for diversity and inclusion as opposed to why are you, why are you trying to make it harder for yourself. Yeah. Um, 
Let's go to the subject of paying it forward and mentorship and inclusion. I'm um, pleased that every one of these um, people up here have committed to mentorship and representation in their films in front and behind the screen. And I'd love to just talk to a couple. Nina, you have a mandate with Forrest that elevates women and people of color both in front of and behind the camera. And, um, and I think you told me you're committed to having two producer shadows for every project that you have. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, yes. Um, I started a nonprofit called Meta Collective a few years ago and really was focused on filmmakers of color and women filmmakers. And then whenever we would throw a dinner event, we had, you know, 20, about 20 people we would invite and it was so wonderful. Then I realized there are no producers. <laughs> and then, so, so that was the shift in the nonprofit is like, oh my God, to have producers in the room, you can really change the narrative when it comes to staffing, to writers, to directors, to actors. Um, so, so we shifted about a year ago and created a producer shadow program. And, and I'm test, it's, I have a test on it right now on my current film. So I have two producer shadow. So they're actually in here somewhere. <laughs> right there, there's one of them. <laughs> yeah. And um, it's because it's important to have more um, voices at that level so you can hire and, and support the filmmakers of color, the women filmmakers. And I, I learned that um, on Godfather Harlem, being in a room, and I'm like, my God, I'm the only, you know, exec producer of color in certain meetings and I'm able to bring up you know concerns and issues and and it was so nice that that Michael Wright of Epics would he'll hear, hear me out and he goes all right let's make these changes so it came to the directors who who um, were directing the episodes to heads of departments on Godfather of Harlem so it took a producer to be able to point these things out in the nicest way and make these changes. So that's why I think it's so important to have producer shadows and more producers coming up in that way where you can champion all these um, concerns that we have. I was surprised um, on a television show I'm working on that ev almost every episode had a director shadow. And I started looking around thinking, that's really great. I love having director shadows. There was someone there all the time learning. And I was thinking, who's training the producers? So I'm really happy the PGA has a producer shadow program. Nina now has a nonprofit that helps with people who want a shadow. So I yeah, think it's and I'm pressuring all my producer friends to take shadows when they go good. on to I'm, go I'm into gonna, their production. I'm going to commit to trying to have at least one shadow on every project. Thank you. What what exactly is a shadow, and is that person paid to do the work, or is it, how does it? Yes, um, so through the nonprofit, I'm now getting donors to come in to provide round trip flight, housing, That's a great. stipend, because many of us who come up in this, the, the traditional route don't come from money, so, so we can't take months off. So that was one of the crucial things, and what I did with some of the investors that came into my current film, and it, aside from their investment into the film, I'm like, can you put aside some money for a producer shadow? So it was a nice way to That's pressure great. them. <laughs> That's fantastic. I think we all should look at doing that, and maybe even the networks and uh, um, independent and main distributors. I'm trying to see if I can see any of them. That's a great, I think it's a great thing for all of us to adopt. Put something, maybe it's a line item in the budget where we have. I think that's a challenge is being a line item in the budget. Everybody's like, no. Okay. So maybe a line <laughs> item in your nonprofit budget. But, but if we can, you know, have more institutional donors or agencies that say, hey, we love your program. We're going to put in money. And then, you know, all of a sudden you have, you know, 20 shadows a year that come out learning what it's like to produce an independent film, television, you know, doc, all that. So it, because producing is so specific and I always say that um, producing is very it's very much a mystery to a lot of people they always say what do you guys actually do so so going through this process it allows people to really see what real producers do you know yeah not just the glamorous part when you're accepting your Oscar on the uh, <laughs> Academy Awards but the real getting up at five in the morning yeah. and uh, and then coming and doing a panel on Saturday <laughs> Dan you also have a a great program going on in Los Angeles. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, we're really excited about it. It's called the Rideback TV Incubator. We're in our first year. And what it is, it is 
uh, fostering underrepresented voices and helping them in cable and TV, uh, cable and streaming, I should say. And how do you help these voices who have staffed on shows but never created their own show? So we looked at the, the tech business and the incubator model and how do we apply that to content creation? So the way it works is people apply for this program. We had more than 200 people apply. We now have eight creators, sorry, we have eight creator teams that are going through an eight month program from idea all the way through final script that we're doing this with MRC. And then we'll package the scripts and take it out to market. And throughout that program, they, we break it up to two teams. So it's eight creator teams, it's actually two teams. So it's 10 people. We created the two writers rooms. And it's this concept we love that you're not only creating your own show, but you're helping, you're helping your fellow colleague, your fellow creator on their show. So if you're in a room, you're writing your own show, and it's your turn that day, everyone's helping you. But the next day, the next four days, you're helping your fellow creator. And it's really important for us, because not only are you getting help from your fellow creator, but by helping your other creators, actually even helping you hone your own skills. So that idea of a writer's room from the very beginning of the process that we're, we're executing. And on top of that, then we have um, showrunners who are acting in a non-writing capacity, mentoring those people, helping to run those rooms. So we have different, eight different uh, showrunners doing that. And it's just been an exciting process um, because again, you're seeing creators helping each other and you're seeing big names in television also helping the next generation. And you're supporting you know, different voices. We have, with Veterans Day coming up on Monday, we have four vets and they have incredible stories to tell. And it's not, only writing about their personal story. It's, it's also creating really commercial stories, but with their distinct point of view. So for us, we, we do our nonprofit work, but also we do what I kind of call a social enterprise, that we want to show that diversity and inclusion is just good business. And it's a good way to bring in new voices and support new voices that people haven't heard, heard from yet. Wow, and is that, how do people get involved in that group, either as a mentor or as coming in? What's the... Yeah, we, you have to apply. So every year we have an application process. And then with mentors, usually we ask them. We ask the mentors because we have a good sense of um, who's willing to give back. But if we need help, we're going to put out that call too. Great. Um, we're talking about kind of mentoring and bringing, having people break in. Do you have any advice for people? I think when I started 20-some years ago, uh, independent film was a little easier to get going and easier to raise money. There were like 23 places I think you could get a film financed. So, you know, I had an easier time, I think, than today um, breaking into the industry. Do you have any advice for someone who's breaking in as a producer? I well, I mean, I, you know, when people come into me, I look for a real point of view. I look for somebody who's done their homework on who they're coming to talk to. I don't mean me personally. I mean, like, why my brand um, would have any interest in that at all. Not that we have to be who we are today, right? We're programming for tomorrow and moving on. But I think just preparation, so that means preparation. And I think really having a point of view, I think the thing that bums me out the most when somebody pitches me an idea, they're like, but, but whatever, we'll do it whatever, whatever way you want. You know, it's like, no, let's just tussle on it. You know what I mean? Like, what my idea doesn't mean it's going to be better. We'll probably go with it. But um, no, I'm joking. <laughs> but, um, but it's like, let's have that conversation back and forth. And somebody that really owns, you know, a vision is, is what I love. I love that kind of producer. So your strong point of view is very important. Don't lose it. I would say just make it. You know, I really believe in the 10,000 hour theory of the, you have to learn from your mistakes and try and try again. And now we're in an era you can make short film. We just, from this panel, you can make all types of, you can do short film, long form, docu, you know, scripted. You know, my, my suggestion is just, just make it and try it and, and learn from it. Um, but you have so many different opportunities now in producing that I think no matter what format you can tell your story and tell that story then learn from it. Or um, it's clearly not just from a development or a creative perspective, but the business of producing is really changing. Um, how are, can you explain any deals that have been made that are different from the way they would have been made before? Do you have any examples of, um, or where you see the deals going? Are we losing the traditional, I know that in the film world, the producer deals, the overhead deals, the pod deals in TV, they're all, they're declining. I think from, from my end on the uh, 
feature film side, you see a huge um, discrepancy between what the streamers will offer you and what the traditional distributors will offer you. In terms of? Of the deal, um, the actual producing deal. So it's really fascinating because you could get spoiled getting deals at Netflix and, and the you know, Amazon or Apple, but, and then you go to traditional and you go into a shock, like, this is so low, but it's actually norm. <laughs> that was a norm. And you're saying they're inflated maybe. At yeah, I, I feel like because streamers are so competitive, so, so it's a good time to be a producer when it comes to streaming deals because they do, what's different is they do back-end buyouts. So whereas traditionally you can possibly earn money from box office bonuses and back end, but when it comes to streamers, because if they don't go theatrical, they do a back end buyout. So that's drastically different than anything we had before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, Elena and I were talking about this before, because I think ultimately as a producer, um, you want to try to own as much of the IP as you can. And so you just have to differentiate their jobs that you take that you're a producer for hire and there may, may be ones that you had a chance to own the underlying IP, and obviously if you own the underlying IP, that gives you more leverage. So I think in this day and age, you just have to balance. There are some jobs, again, that you take uh, because somebody else already owns IP, and you can help them expand out that IP, and there may be some that are not already well-known, that if you can own that IP and, and, and create something big from it, it's best for you to own it if you can. Yeah, I totally agree that, because some dude, I would have gotten an IP or a script I'd really love. I'm like, I could flip this to a studio. And then, and then Forrest and our attorneys like, you should keep that one for yourself. Make it, and you own that IP, and then ex, you know, expand on it. So, so one thing on the independent film side, whether it's from Fruitville to Star to bother you, we actually own the IP. So it's pretty in incredible that you know, we licensed it to, to these um, studios for distribution, but we still retain the IP ownership. Roxanne, Roxanne on Netflix, they, they licensed it from us. We still own it. Dope, we still own it, you know, nice. so. But I say this with trepidation, because Elaine's looking at me, because Elaine wants to own the IP, right? <laughs> so I mean, you should talk about it, because also the networks, there's also this push and pull where the networks, the studios, they want to own the IP. So it all depends on kind of what leverage you have. Well, that, you just said it. I mean, it all is, you know, what leverage you have. And I'm in a very different biz, I'm in a very different business than like um, a film, a film, a film, a film. And, uh, and it really is. And so w w what I was only going to add to the conversation and to the discussion is, and I'm sure, you know, Banks sees this too, is w we have the same number of time to fill, but repeats aren't working in the same way anymore, right? So we're looking for more content with pretty much the same budgets. So everybody, I'm not a math major, but everybody can figure that out, which is oftentimes we're making bigger orders for a little less money per episode of things we really believe in. But that can turn into a gigantic order for someone, right? And um, that's the conversation we're having with producers now. And it's, you know, it, it's, uh, it's allowing us to have more nights of original content so that there is something fresh to watch and um, you know we can get people there, and I, you know I don't know. It's been, it's it's been working for us. I don't think we're going so low that it doesn't make sense. The quality of the show has to be, and we're in healthy partnerships with our friends, but our producing partner and friends. But um, but uh, you know that's that's how we're seeing it. That's what we're needing to do business wise. When you're asking about that. Do, do you guys know about the statutory protection in Great Britain for nonfiction ideas and producers? They have this really cool thing that by the law for most kinds of nonfiction productions, I'm not sure about scripted, by law the production company doesn't have to give away all the rights to the broadcasting network. So it's a lot of the programs you've seen like Survivor and those kinds of shows that come from Great Britain to the United States come this way because the production company has retained ownership and it's a really cool thing. That's fantastic, were you able to do? We do it every once in a while. There has to be sort of leverage to play against the network and it's, but it's really hard to do in the nonfiction yeah. world. Uh, just going on the IP ownership, it's the, the market has shifted drastically. So it's not as easy to say, I'm gonna 
you know, be, because the streamers are, they want it up front. So if you have an IP original idea, they rather fund it and acquire it from you later. So that has shifted. And, and so that is um, kind of troubling for emerging producers to come into that. I mean, fortunately for me, I had the runway to build out my producing career. But as an independent producer, that's the challenge. Because if you have something pretty decent, pretty great, you know, Netflix is like, we'll give you the money and go make your film instead of you trying to raise your money everywhere else and not getting it made. You'll take that Netflix deal and they own your IP. So that's what's shifted. Right, it's hard to turn it down when it's right there, bird in hand. But I think what you're but, saying is sometimes it's better to keep it. Can I ask a IP. question? And then yeah. you're not locked to like reboots, right? Because hmm? the reboots of things, right? If, if, if they take it, they take If somebody it. wants to remake one of your films in a few years, and they own it. You don't have. Depends how you structure your producing deal. Yeah, you, you can. Yeah. You can try to get it. Yeah. Um, Elaine, what um, what kind of projects are you looking for? <laughs> oh gosh. So, um, you know, I would say a, you know A and E is a general entertainment brand, but um, we have no. We are only nonfiction. We are really look looking for kind of that next provocative. Um, you know, what is the next Leah Remini would be fantastic. You know, Intervention has been a hallmark show for many years, and that is the kind of um, uh, kind of trailblazing format that we would love to find what is that next incarnation. But, um, but you know, we are interested in live. We do um, amazing limited series. We just had a fantastic one with Banks on the Trump dynasty. And um, he also did a biography on JFK, so we are doing bio JFK Jr., so we are doing biographies, bringing biography back. So, uh, you know, that's kind of how we're doing our, our more premium fair. We had uh, something called the Clinton Affair, I think you mentioned, mm -hmm. that did really well for us last year. So uh, that, things with IP, if it's not like owned, but it's, you know, um, in terms of a biography or a moment in time that people will remember and feel, and then you have access that people haven't seen, or in this case, we had Monica Lewinsky and Kenneth Starr and Alex Gibney's company had done a great job putting all of that together, um, produced it well, but um, that's what we're looking for. Thank you. Um, I'm going to let you pick the last question to answer. I'm going to give you two different questions. One from Fona in the audience. What's the hardest conversation you've had in your filmmaking career? Or what's your top piece of advice for working producers in how to navigate the future of this business? Um, I'll, I'll pick the second one. What's my... Uh, top advice, right, for, for working producers. Um, for those of you who are pursuing feature films and on the independent side, whether you flip it to a studio or later, really understand film financing. I think it's key. Um, you hear a lot of producers who are just like great logistical producers. They come from line producing or they have great relationships, they know how to develop. But if they don't, if you don't know film financing, you are at a disadvantage. And, and the reason I say that is when you're trying to champion films that need whether development money or actual production money, and you don't know how to work with your financiers on terms, how to report to them, how to work with them when they show up on set, you know, that type of stuff. <laughs> It, it leaves you with a gap of you know being above of you know what you can do already. So I, my advice is really understand understand film financing. Um, I, I'll also answer the second question, and I would say that I think it's something Dan actually said earlier. But in the nonfiction world, if you have an idea that you want to sell to a lane or come to a production company like mine to partner up with. Um, making a great tape, there's no substitute for that. And it should really say something, but it needs to be put together really well. It doesn't have to be long at all. Um, when we, my company's been around for about 14 years, and maybe in the second year, we had an unexpected slow period. And it was the first time we really weren't prepared for it. And I went off to make a thing for MTV about a small town hockey team, a junior hockey team in Canada. and it's the greatest tape I've ever made. I just loved it, and it's all sort of hands-on. I was up there by myself. I flew on bearskin airlines to get to this town. <laughs> and I came back, and MTV was somewhat appalled. I made a great tape, but they're like, this is small town, it's Canada, it's hockey. We're not gonna do it. 
However, we have this high fashion thing with Naomi Campbell we want you guys to do. And it was such a ridiculous association to make from <laughs> this gritty story to the, but they liked the tape. And there you, there's no substitute for that. And if you make a good tape, people are gonna see it and they're gonna wanna work with you. And you have, as Dan suggested, you have control over that, so. I'm also gonna answer the second question. And for me, um, I've been reflecting about my career. People ask me, what has made me successful in my movies? And I've isolated to three things, and I call it the three C's, which is creativity, collaboration, and community. And I just encourage you guys, I um, have realized that it's better to partner and share, that it is so hard out there to get these big movies made, even the small movies made, that Again, I encourage you guys to find great partners. I was really encouraged hearing Noah Baumbach talk and, and his relationship with Wes, with Wes Anderson. You have to find your tribe. So all of us are talking, the things that we do, we do because we are part of teams, that producing is a team sport. So with the two popes, I had Jonathan Eyrick and I had Tracy Seward, and we did it together, the three of us. None of us could have done it alone. And so part of this is, again, I want to emphasize, meet your fellow producers. You never know who you can partner with because it's so hard out there in time of disruption in a time where agents uh, don't have, uh, it's our writers are firing their, their agents, that now is the time to band together because you're gonna be stronger together as a team than you are, a uh, team of producers than you are as a single producer. You want me advice? Um, well, we have no seconds left. I would just say, like, b believe in yourself, your project, it eventually will happen and have some fun. Great, thank you guys, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you to all of our panelists for the extraordinary advice and remember community, 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 fellowship, that's what we're gonna be doing next. Whoa, 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 whoa. One quick second before we go networking. We gotta say thank you. Uh, so thank you to Lori and the panelists. That was our last session. Um, hope this was a great day, great experience for you. Just very quickly, I need to thank some people. We would not have been able to do this. I'm Michelle with the PGA. I want to thank, first and foremost, our supervising producer, Liz Hart, and her team, Amanda, Josh, Jen, Nicole. They did an amazing job, all the volunteers, so thank you. And I need to thank our staff. Uh, Diana White, who put together all our programs, Gina Hoffner, who's been backstage, Quasi Foley, Connor Hammonds, they've, done, they've been amazing. And I'd like to thank also Vance and Susan, our national executive directors. Um, they've been amazingly supportive of what we've been trying to do here in New York, and I just wanted to say thank you. And Kay? Don't move. Also thank you to the sponsors. They want us to succeed as a guild and as individuals. I encourage you to reach out to them to see how they can help you do that. Do you know that every single moderator was a member of the guild today? And many, if not most, of the panelists, the day is not over. Your work begins right now. You have till 7 o'clock to find your next collaborators and partners today. If you're not a member of the guild, you need to be. If you're a member of the guild, show up. We do good stuff all the time. Okay, now go move. It's right back there, the Tinker Auditorium.